Hello, Savian. Maybe this will be a short meeting. I want to jinx myself. <laughs> Ready to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, let's call the meeting to order. Um, there's no public comments. So we can get into the presentation. Um, I um, Before I do that, I'll uh, see if Dr. Jenkins have any opening words. Um, I'll share a little bit of my take on this. I'm, I'm excited to get some updates on Pathways, um, Pathways uh, implementation. Um, was something that I was really looking forward to. I was working at a district at that time. My daughter was uh, the poster child of, of getting pathways into, into the district and uh, was really excited to, in particular, one thing that she would say often was to make sure that um, um, the high school was, was relevant, that she was studying things that were relevant to us, to her and to other young people like herself. So I'm really excited to, to hear uh, uh, about Pathways, uh, the implementation and the lessons learned. Uh, like any implementation is good to, to have a three years, to give it a three years to, to know how things um, are working and what we learned. What can we learn uh, from positives? I know that there were like a lot of positives that uh, are leaked, leaked uh, out of pathways into uh, into other areas of, of general ed. So I'm excited for this for this presentation. I'm also excited for um, looking at our timeline and uh, listening to stories. And then uh, for folks that really uh, like to kind of get a robust data uh, analysis, there is also opportunity for that as well. Um, just like as you know, all the other presentations on this work group, we ask you to uh, take note of your questions. Uh, we try, the presentation is really robust. Uh, there's a lot of information. So if there are specific things that you are thinking about, they may be addressed later on, or we're gonna do some intentional pauses to, to get folks' voices, questions and concerns. With that said, I want to pass on to Dr. Jenkins uh, before turning it to, to Lisa and her team. Well, Nanda, first of all, thank you for your comments. And I tell you, coming into the district, researching it, one of the things that I looked at was pathways. That's always been a passion of mine since I've been in education and seeing how we can give our students as many opportunities to excel and follow their own passion and look at what we're doing here in Madison. This is definitely, you know, the, a start, a good start to uh, doing just that. And I'm glad that your daughter has had that experience. And then talking to Lisa and uh, Cindy and other members of our team, we're definitely moving forward and we're understanding as you start something, uh, you know, we have to always just kind of like assess where we are and where we need to go. And I think the team has been very reflective because we want it to be uh, an opportunity for all of our students to really realize their dreams, follow their passions. On the referendum trail, we talked a lot about not only graduating our students ready for college and career, uh, but also community. And I also mentioned articulated skilled trades, which gives us uh, an opportunity within our pathways to pivot to follow those students' passions. So if they wanna change today, they could change, but it doesn't take away from the other opportunities that they wanna experience in high school. So when you hear from the team tonight, you kind of see where we are to date haven't had some real had some real lessons learned uh, from our staff and just implementing anything, you always gonna have some lessons learned. And then they'll also speak to the future as when uh, I've been having conversations with business uh, community individuals about where they are too. And they're excited to know where we're really gonna be going with our next steps and how we're gonna involve them as well. So having said that, I'll turn it over to uh, Lisa and the great team to talk about it a little bit here, and Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. I um, am really excited to have this conversation tonight. Um, Dr. Jenkins, I think that you, um, I wanna thank you for that introduction. The work tonight and without further delay, 
I am going to turn it over to Cindy, who is our Executive Director of Secondary Programs and Personalized Pathways. And then our um, fabulous Secondary Chiefs team, Mike Hernandez and Dr. Marvin Pryor will also be joining us in the conversation today. So I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. And Cindy, I'm gonna hand it off to you to start. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Dr. Jenkins. And thanks, Ananda. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Uh, Barb, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting the slideshow, I'm just going to open it up and, and talk about our outcomes real quick before I turn it over to Dr. Pryor. I just want to also make sure the board understands where we're going to have intentional pausing points for questions. Cindy, I'm going to ask you if you can turn up your, your audio just a little bit. Turn it up? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a little better. Yes, thank you. Great. I feel like I'm in a sprint commercial. Um, so, <laughs> so we are going to, could you go to the next slide, Barb? Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, two uh, different updates tonight. Uh, first, we want to provide an overall update around where we are with some of our successes and challenges at the secondary level as it relates to virtual learning, right? Our schools are working tirelessly. We have some really great things happening. We wanted to share that. Um, when we're done with that part of the presentation, we will pause to see if there's any questions related to that. And then the second half of our presentation, we will dive right into, as Ananda and Dr. Jenkins and Lisa all mentioned, um, an update on where we are with personalized pathways, what we've learned along the way, and where we see uh, ourselves going as our next step. So I just wanted to provide that, and we will also pause at the end of that presentation for comments, questions, et cetera. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over and Dr. Pryor is gonna start. Um, Mike will chime in after that and I'll just kind of uh, jump in along the way with both of them. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Pryor. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that everyone has had a very productive day. And I would like to pause just to say, first of all, thank you to the Board of Education and to our superintendent, Dr. Jenkins, for allowing the secondary team this opportunity to come and share updates from the secondary side of the house tonight. Um, as Sydney shared earlier, our presentation this evening will focus primarily on two areas, virtual learning and personalized pathways, which happens to be something very, very special to me. And the fact that it was a big part of my work in the Atlanta area where I uh, functioned in a state that required all of our uh, graduating seniors to be pathway completers. So I have a special um, uh, uh, connection to pathways. And so I'm so excited that we're having this conversation tonight. And so you'll hear more about that later. Um, <clears throat> as we reflect on these two areas that we elevated, that we are focused on tonight, I want to let you know that we are still uh, and still remain consistent uh, regarding our uh, vision and mission in regards to our students, regardless if we're face-to-face -face or in virtual platform, we still remain committed and we still remain aligned to the district strategic goal number one, which is to ensure that all the students who graduate from MMSD graduate college, career, and community ready. The chart that you see before you, which uh, is the next chart, please. This chart that you see is a reflection of the knowledge, skills, and the disposition that we feel that will be required for all of our students to realize this outcome of college, career, and community ready. Next slide, please. You know, often we get lost in our work by thinking about the shifts that, that are necessary to ensure success in this virtual platform. And we negate pausing and reflecting on the things that are going well. So if you will, just allow me about two, three minutes and I would like to take us on a reflective walk so that we can see the path that we ventured, number one, and number two, see the success and the successes that we have made during this journey. So as we reflect back uh, approximately nine months ago, March, we were thrust in this virtual world of teaching and learning as a result of a worldwide pandemic. There was no blueprint, 
nor did we have sufficient time to plan adequately for the shifts that would be required to function in a virtual world. Teachers felt a sense of isolation and anxiety was high. Engagement and communication in the virtual world was a huge, huge challenge. And so therefore we pretty much operated in a reactive and a survival mode for the remainder of the school year. But we made it to the end, not knowing whether or not we would return for the 2021 school year in a virtual platform or a brick and mortar platform, we immediately began to reflect on the experiences and we solicited feedback from our stakeholders and began to plan for the shifts that would be necessary to realize success in the 2021 school year. Next slide. We realized that our greatest challenges were centered around three areas. Number one, instruction, social emotional support, and external partnerships. On the instructional side, we created schedules that were composed of synchronous and asynchronous opportunities for our student learners. Students had an opportunity to engage in direct instruction as well as independent practice where they showed ownership in the learning process. We built in time for school-wide collaboration for teachers to come together and network and plan together to ensure success in the virtual platform. And we implemented professional development, a professional development calendar to ensure that our teachers were equipped with the strategies, the tools and best practices so that they could successfully facilitate uh, meaningful and engaging lessons in this virtual platform. And finally, we were able to continue to offer the opportunities and flexibility for students to earn credit through work-based learning. Next slide, please. We also noticed that there was a great need for social emotional support. As you know, we have all been and continue to be affected socially or emotionally or both by this pandemic. Therefore, social emotional support remain a primary focus for us today. So we implemented an advisory program to ensure that every student was connected to a caring adult in the building. This is another area that is very special to me. Letter School in Atlanta had a 27% graduation rate. And I will honestly say that the advisory role played a significant role in elevating us to realizing 100% graduation rate. And so we instituted this advisory role for staff members where they each was responsible for 10 to 15 young people that they really acted as the parents in that role of local parents, I should say. And they were responsible for the social and emotional and academic success for all of our students. And it's going very well today. As I make my rounds to schools and doing my drop-ins, I marvel at the work that our teachers are doing every day in this virtual platform. It is something to see, it's something that you will marvel over. And I am convinced and encouraged that once we get on the other side of this pandemic, teaching and learning is gonna be at a level that we've never experienced before. We also implemented affinity groups, uh, or affinity circles, I should say, for staff and students. And we all know in MMSD how important our affinity circles are. It provides that space for individuals to come together to really speak their truth, a safe environment where they can come and share experiences with their colleagues. We also added virtual mentors for those students who needed an extra level of support. And many of our principals have taken on the role of reaching out and uh, pretty much adopting students to ensuring success in this virtual platform. And finally, we utilized and continue to utilize social media platforms to enhance our communication with families. I honestly believe that the communication that we see today between the school and the families are stronger than it's ever been. And I can't wait to see what that looks like when we return back to brick and mortar. Next slide, please. And so last year, as you recall, many of our students had to shift their college plans. Therefore, we intentionally plan an additional layer of support for our seniors to ensure smooth and uninterrupted, excuse me, transition from high school 
to post-secondary options of their choice. Next slide. We leveraged the resources that we had in-house. And one of the resources that we had was the AVID program. And through AVID, we have online tutoring today. We have ACT prep for sophomores and juniors. We're providing coaching and support with college applications and financial aid process for our seniors. And we're also ensuring that all of our seniors apply to a minimum of three colleges before graduating high school. Um, I've only shared a few examples of some of the shifts that we have made and some of the work that we're doing in our school. There are many, there are many great things that are happening. And I so believe that as a district and as a team, we have to elevate the positive things that are happening because our teachers are working very hard, our students are working very hard, and we're really, really, really recognizing and seeing the results of that work. At this time, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Michael Hernandez, and he will share with you updates on targeted support and community partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pryor. Um, um, we, we have one slide flip, so I'm gonna talk about the targeted student supports first. Um, at the end of the quarter, our, our schools, our secondary schools did some reflection, made some adjustments. We shared them with the community, we shared them with, with staff and with students. We're gonna talk about a few examples of things that we have done. It's not all of the things we've done, but um, a few high leverage examples. We ran some data and thank you RPEO and Chelsea Tubbs for, for helping facilitate this, in which we were able to see 80% students that were not attending school, 80% are logging on virtually, 80% or less. Students that were logging in, 80% or more, but had one or more F on their, on their um, report card. And we began thinking about additional ways to re-engage or to, to look for these students. And I'm gonna talk a few about a few of these examples. Room to Rise is one in which some of our schools are working on, in which they have established particular rooms through the SSIT or the student support team process, identifying students, being able to pull them in and have one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two um, opportunities to look at missing assignments, high leverage summative assignments, and being able to break it down in which they they can co-work with these students to, to help earn credits. Um, uh, the, the room to rise is staffed throughout the day. Um, st staff are giving up some time to be able to work with these students. And then they also then become advocates to be able to help the students reach out to other teachers um, uh, to find out other missing assignments. Another neat uh, pro program is take out and turn in. It almost is exactly what it sounds like. Take out to turn in, Mafala has leveraged um, uh, donations from 100 black men as, along with se several other organizations and teachers in the evening are, are reaching out to the students and establishing a time and then having meals delivered to the students through Grubhub and then so that the teacher and the students can eat together and attack and do some work together to be able to catch up. Um, uh, an example of students that are attending school 80% or more of the time, but that still have multiple uh, Ds or Fs, uh, West parent-teacher conferences. Uh, they shifted their approach. They did their parent-teacher conferences. But then they identified an extended time in which they were able to reach out to particular families and then be able to sit down and talk about um, uh, the engagement, what it looks like, how it feels, and what adjustments they might be able to make to help support their students um, uh, to, take, to earn credits in this. But one of the things that I'm most excited about is Capitol High evening office hours. We sat down and we were looking at um, uh, students' engagement 80% or lower. And then we added an, an extra question that we started talking in, in Capitol, um, Karen Stocks Glover, Quinn, uh, they surveyed their students and approximately 75 of their students have actually started working right now. And they're working during the day to help supplement and support their families, which meant that they're not able to uh, log on and work during the day. The students were still earning credit through grit, through determination, they're still earning credit, but they are doing the work 
logging in in the evenings and on the weekends. So Karen and Quinn then um, spoke with students and established some evening office hours. They were able to help uh, pay the teachers to work in the evenings, but then they set up these times in which kids were coming in, kids, young adults were logging in, meeting with their teachers to get any supports that they needed in the evenings and then turning in and getting their work. We have since then reached out to Jay's department to think about how we can rethink some of this attendance so that we can be adaptive to the needs of the students as they are also taking on some serious responsibilities of supporting their families. Can you go to the next slide, please? Dr. Pryor has already spoken on this, but I wanna highlight one thing. Our Boys and Girls Club partnership with AVID. We are one of the few in the nation that has this type of partnership. And I think it's an attestment to, to this partnership in which the, the AVID tutorials are still going on. Uh, board members, I wanna highlight this. Majority of these college students and community members that are, are fulfilling these tutorials are mere models of our students. It's not just an academic support that we have set up here. It's also a pure social emotional support. Students are being able to talk to college students and, their, and the adults that are, are running these tutorials. And it's also time to interact and to see that as a, as a young adult, they're not in this alone and they have additional supports out there. And so one, I just want to use this opportunity to thank Boys and Girls Club from, and TOPS for maintaining this partnership, the tutorials, to maintaining the support for extended ed, um, filling out all of the um, extended educational opportunities. If you can go to the next slide, please. One thing that we have learned, one thing that I've learned, I will own this. One thing have I learned, um, the pandemic, it's been hard on everybody. <laughs> but one thing that is for sure, we saw this on the voting for our referendum, and we're gonna see this in the next couple of slides. Our Madison community has just stepped up. If you look at the, the right side of the slide, the medium and high intensity partners, and then as you're looking through it, this is the who's of who of serious power brokers in the city that are stepping up and providing supports for our, our students. I mean, going through here and you have you know, the Goodman Community Center and Kennedy Heights, and you have AVID, and you have our, our, our forward Madison and Hooventude, and Central Espano, 100 Black Men. All of these programs that are touched have touched between 12 and 1,500 students during, or as we just started this second and going first, mid first, and second um, quarter of this year. This is a testament to our community stepping up and wanting to support our district and our students. For the high schools, if you go to the second slide, the next slide, please. For the high schools, the, the selection is a little bit smaller, but just as detailed and supportive. And we're and Bren or Bree, who is working with, with our community engagement, and Michelle Nichols. I mean, we want to thank them so much for the work that they've done. But as we look through here, you know, we still have Escaleta and we have Simpson Street, or Street Free Press. We have the Early College STEM Academy and People Program the Sanchez and the Man Scholars. I'd be remiss if I didn't pass on to the Carey family um, our condolences for Miss Man passing. But the Man Scholars, the Journey Mental Health, these community members are supporting to the, the tune to almost a thousand students that have touched um, uh, from our community members working through this pandemic time. I mean, if we look at all of these slides that Dr. Pryor and I are going, I wanna highlight my personal self, I will own this again, the partnerships that our community is putting in to support both our students and our staff. Uh, next slide, please. We, we continue are looking at additional options for graduation. Um, the Innovative Alternative Education Partnerships. We have spoken about this in the past, but I still want to highlight this, uh, the gateway to college, we're still working on this for virtual um, options. Um, we, we're continuing it and we're, in, we're enrolling students in for an additional way to earn a um, uh, 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 high school diploma. Operation Fresh Start, we just met with Greg and his team the other day. And again, highlighting the fact that, that students are still getting these opportunities for Operation Fresh Start. Um, um, it is, there is more of a virtual setting, but we're still looking at ways and for the students to receive some of these hands-on skills 
through OFS. Uh, the next slide, please. Oscar is still working with our students for Omega. There still is that limited uh, availability because of the in-person testing for the GED, but it's still an option that our students are able to do and ask around the South Side holding it down. Um, the Madison College HSEB program is still working through, but again, it's through the virtual setting. And so we're still working through some of the processes and some of the, um, uh, the holds up of connectivity and access but we're trying to figure ways around this and working with Madison College's partners. I'm excited about the next slide, is that we have the micro school, uh, micro schools, West and the Transition Academy, and was last year we were able to highlight um, uh, some of the successes uh, of the, the West uh, micro school, and, and we're, we're still running with this. We have the students meeting, um, uh, still it's all virtual, um, and we're, we're talking with students about making positive decisions and, and staying focused, but with the Transition Academy as well and looking at ways to earn credit. We're seeing some really positive things. We've redesigned night school through the, the virtual capacity in which we're focusing on just juniors and seniors at this point, and we're offering just English and math courses. In the past, we had it at two sites. We've adjusted to having it at one site right now but we've added a Saturday session for our ELL students for sheltered courses. And again, another way to be able to support um, uh, students um, in the virtual setting. And then the last one here, the GED2 option, or option two, or GEDO2, we were, we were finally able to pull in a staff member that has an alternative license. And we just actually submitted out to the, to the high schools, um, the counselors and the principals, that we're able now to be able to recruit students um, uh, through the GEDO2 program. It is virtual um, uh, and we have it set up in which we'll have morning and afternoon sessions in which students will be able to work through not a GED, but to earn a diploma in an alternate um, setting. And that was something that we had talked about last year, but wanting to offer this is again, having almost, I used this word the other day and I know that it's quite dated, but a Rolodex of options for students that have become or are disengaged from school, maybe the brick and mortar school as well, but we're trying to be as adaptive as well as technical to support our students to help find their path so that they're college, career, and community ready. If you can go to the next slide, please. This is something that we're working extremely hard on. Our Metro Juvenile Detention, our Metro Shelter Homes, and our Metro Jail or Huber programs. Um, uh, Megan is able to take, she took Paris's position and we were able to hire Yana Williams. And we've been working exclusively with our Metro programs. Um, um, we were able to move uh, uh, one of our social workers that was working primarily with the West Micro School and we're able to transition some of her allocation so that she's able to help in the um, juvenile detention setting as well. Doing our checking connects with students and helping when they are transitioning out of the Metro program. So Damaris, it, it, it works hard, has great relations with the students. And so she, she is able then to help us with some of that transition parts. When you're reading these bullets, you're going to see a theme on here is that we're still running into problems with some connectivity. And then unfortunately, um, with access to computers when students are, are in their rooms. I don't know if there's a better way to say that or not, but there are students that are not able to take computers into their rooms. And so we're trying to figure out ways in which we are able to provide additional access to those computers. Um, but this is something again, that this is, this is um, the work that we're gonna be focusing on in the second quarter um, and beyond to ensure that students have this access um, um, virtually to have this access when they transition back into school, there's not a hopeless hole that they've been dug into. And then that's another way that we've seen this connection with our students. Next slide, please. The last part here that I'm gonna be speaking on before we take questions on here and I wanna highlight through here is we've talked about some of the positives. We all know that there's been some struggles as well. The connectivity issues, I'm on Chad, TJ, they've done an amazing job getting Chromebooks, um, getting 
hot spots to families, but we're still running into areas of the city that we're not able to access um, uh, through cell towers. So it's something that we're, we're still working through it. Also on this is if, if there is a hot spot or two in a, a, in a house, there are at times multiple students trying to access that hotspot. So that those connectivities. We have students that are struggling with not having in-person engagement opportunities. We know this. And so we're, 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 our, our teachers have done an amazing job trying to build in both social and emotional supports as, as well as holding um, rigor in, in their curriculum. But this is something, again, as we're sitting down and trying to, to work through. Prior to prioritizing supports for families. And then that last bullet, the seasonal pandemic depression. We know from our counselors, our social workers and our school sites, students have been reaching out for additional supports. I remind you of the comment I made earlier. I, I still talk to many avid students and they almost look forward to the tutorials to be able to speak to some of the older college students as much as they, they, they look for, for the academics is because again, it's almost therapeutic. With staff, we know that the work, the, the, there's, more, there's not enough hours in the day. Our, our teachers, our staff, our principals, they're working extremely hard to keep up with this pace of both trying to plan here in the now and thinking about how it's gonna look next week, next month, and so forth. Um, uh, balancing professional and, and your family priorities in a single space. We've all know when we were working in our place of employment, you had the downtime of driving from work to home to kind of decompress, to try to, to process the day so you're fully present when you're home. Now it might be just the turn around the, uh, down the hallway and you haven't had time to do this. And we know that that's a struggle. So we're working at, on ways in which we might be able to help and I say this as we are trying to do some planning. Um, uh, it's on everybody's minds. But we're trying to ensure that we're to to ensure that there is a balance between professional and, and and personal time. And then our, our staff as well. The seasonal and pandemic, we've had we've had many staff that are reaching out. We're trying to provide the supports um, uh, through our human resources, um, uh, as well as just being a listener and just try to process with our peers um, uh, to provide supports that, that we're all in this together and eventually we're gonna come out stronger. Um, uh, and again, just the unknown. It says pandemic and nation, but um, um, I hate to bring politics in, but just the unknown of what's gonna happen next week after the holidays. And that's just something that's always on people's minds. And right now we're, we're hoping that we're able to focus on the, the, the right now and what we can do to support our students and each other. I think now's the time that we possibly could come off of screen share for a minute to answer any questions before we transition into um, Pathways. Hey, Mike, before we, or Ananda, real quick, before we turn it over, I just want to add two things and, and clarify one. For Operation Fresh Start, uh, students are actually face-to-face. -face. They're on the job site and they're working um, so either through conservation or construction, and uh, they're, they've been very intentional about having students in what they call kind of uh, pods, so students aren't interacting with other groups. And then the second is I just want to add to uh, the conversations around Metro that we have been working really closely um, and are excited about the partnership that we are um, strengthening with uh, Metro and have been uh, focusing on a lot of paper pencil packets, assessments, and other uh, items to not let the connectivity and the computers get in the way and ensure that our students are still receiving education. We've also changed kind of um, the waiting period of once a student actually enters into there when we can start some of those educational opportunities. So I just wanted to add that to uh, this conversation before we start questions. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks, Cindy. No, thank you so much, Cindy. And do you mind expanding a little bit more? Because I think uh, that slide that Mike covered has a lot of information. Uh, I'm just curious about like what what has been your you know the challenges uh, that you're seeing with Metro with uh, the collaboration. I mean, quarantine the collaboration with attention facility, our staff's inability to be in person. I'm, I'm just 
I'm just curious about how it has been, how have you all negotiated that? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I think some of the challenges are the exact same as the challenges that we're seeing in our other 50 sites, right? Uh, in terms of virtual learning, in terms of planning, in terms of uh, not being able to be face-to-face -to, -face to really build those relationships. Our teachers at Metro, I, I think, really, really depend on being able to get to know those individuals, get to build those relationships with them, really focus on the social-emotional support. So um, a few things that we have done, and again, I'm excited about with both Megan and Yana uh, kind of being in their roles now, is we have... Uh, started to build out a new agreement with uh, Metro, all four divisions to think differently about the partnership, to think differently about the educational aspects of it. I think that the reality is that hasn't always been uh, had full attention, right? I mean, I think in the past, uh, there's been transitions that have happened. There's been lack of ownership there. So we are really uh, building that out. We've met a few times with them to talk about the educational programming. We've gotten them to adjust in terms of when we can start our educational experiences with students, knowing that in the past, if a student was uh, going to one of the metro divisions and transitioning over to like a Lincoln Hills, there was a pause on their education. And we have now said, one, because of quarantine, and two, because of COVID-19, that as soon as a student enters through those doors, we want them to receive educational opportunities. We want them to receive an assessment. We want to understand where they are, and we want to start from day one. Um, it's definitely still a work in progress, Ananda and team, just in terms of the, the physical place, because our teachers are virtual, so they're not able to be in those spaces. We're working on some one-on-one -on -one connections where they're setting up some one-on-one -on -one times with students, working around uh, some of the uh, risk kind of confinements that we have over at Metro and st uh, for other times of like the classroom time versus uh, time with family, time with legal, et cetera. But um, we've been really working on that. And we're also really excited for when we get out of COVID-19 just to continue to take that partnership and uh, continue to strengthen it for our students. The last thing I will say is simultaneously, we're really working on what we call um, kind of that transition back to their home school and what those processes look like. I think that that also has varied in the past. Um, when students are either going into Metro or coming out of Metro, we haven't always had the strongest collaboration. We haven't always carried those students' coursework and credits back to the home site. So we're really working on what those processes are and also the restorative side of it, what needs to happen in order to make sure our students feel welcome and belonging back at their home site, as well as ensuring everything that they did while they were at Metro actually carries back with them and they get credit for. So that's uh, something else that we're working on in addition to that. Uh, Mike has something else to add, and I would love to also hear from anyone on the team if we have been able to do better with uh, IEP's implementation. I know that has been uh, it was a wrinkle before pandemic. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Um, and now to just to go off of what Cindy was going to say, the last part is, is the part that I wanted to touch on, is that when we were brick and mortar, there was a definite disconnect of the type of instruction and the output, the input and the output that was going on in, in the classroom. Uh, we strategically created a position for a social worker to be connected in to help with that transition, to help the students um, slide in and to ensure that there was work being um, provided and then transitioned back into the home school. That is one of the benefits of the, uh, of the virtual learning right now is there's Google Classrooms. I'm sorry, I muttered there. Google Classrooms. And there's option to opportunities to go into those classes and pull what real-time learning is going how you can submit it in so you have grades and so that you have a participation, all of those, those are now options. This is one thing that we can and should be able to maintain when we return back to brick and mortar. Maintaining these spaces, now if you have somebody that is ill that's gonna be missing school, 
If you have somebody that has immigration issues or ha that is going to go home or go to, I'm just going to use Mexico as the example, our families, they, we have students now that are going and still being actively engaged and not having to take a month off of school. And that's something that's important that we say. So I know that doesn't necessarily connect, but it entirely connects with, with the juvenile detention question that you had. Thank you. Dr. Pryor, were you going to add anything else? Uh, yes, yeah. Cindy and Mike captured most of it there. But I, I would say, you know, upon my arrival, working with the Opportunity Youth uh, Group, uh, Megan and um, Yana, one of the things that I have been pushing for is and ensuring that we have a systemic approach of providing service to our students as they uh, doing the intake process and the release process. I think there's a platform that we could uh, utilize that would perhaps has been underutilized and that is our counselors at their home schools. You know, I think we've had a practice where we kind of released them and we were hands off. And so one of the things that I'm pushing the team to do to make sure that we partner and remain that, re re maintain that relationship for our students so that, you know, they have a sense of belonging. And when they are released and returned back, you know, we have a platform that we can set those students up for success, you know, and I think that is primary, is our primary responsibility. We have to let them know that we have not given up on them and that once they return, that we're gonna do everything that we can possibly do to ensure success for those students. And so I think it comes down to really systematizing our practice and making sure that we have a practice that is trump tight, if you will, uh, for those students that um, unfortunately get caught up in that situation. And mm -hmm. so I just wanted to elevate that tonight because I think we have to continue to utilize our um, counselors as well as our social workers in-house. Thank, thank you, Dr. Pryor. Before I open to Ali and Nikki, one more question around this topic. How uh, any anyone in the team can comment on IEP, IEP implementation? Um, is John, are you asking John or are you asking? Just to anyone, like we, we know that that was a, there was always challenging uh specific depending on different situations of students once they were in the juvenile systems our systems have not always uh were aligned and and oftentimes there were delays in instructions uh or not all the ip so and now you know quarantine and all those things it's making ip implementation even more challenging so I'm just curious, if, you know, are we paying attention, like how are we paying attention to that? How are we addressing uh, uh, those items specifically given that many of our students uh, that are, they're getting caught up on a system, like you said, Dr. Pryor, mm -hmm. are, are students who has an IP, who have an IP? Yeah, but I think that's a great question. One of the things we'll do, uh, Lisa and I, when we follow up with John, we're doing our one-on-ones just to ensure that it is happening at that particular level. Uh, because that was one of the pieces, too, that I know that we have been concerned about. But let me just ask John that specifically. Okay. And I'm responding. We'll get it back to all the board members. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. And I have Ali and then Nikki. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation and the series of updates we received. It's really, uh, you know, I profoundly appreciate the attention that's been paid to our students in Metro. Um, and I hope that we continue to have an even more robust focus on those specific students. <clears throat> an area of concern for me in terms of, of looking at that slide was the 14 days of quarantine uh, portion in which I, I'm curious just specifically, are students receiving services while they're quarantined and what all does that look like? And also the average student um, is only in the juvenile detention center for eight days. So does this mean that students are experienced a, a prolonged period of time there in order to adhere to the standards of quarantine? Um, or, or is that just kind of the recommended amount of time students would spend if they're there for an extended period of time? Um, and, and I can respond um, to that question. In my work with Megan and, and Yana, I know um, approximately a month ago, uh, that same question uh, was elevated 
uh, we had some issues in regards to the intake process and the quarantine process for students where they were actually being denied um, access to computers and the work that was being provided for them. Um, I encouraged the team to work with uh, the individuals there on site and they were able to work that out. Uh, they did not want to give them computers, but they were able to give them um, packets of work that students were able to have access to um, in that process. And so uh, from that last conversation about a month ago, that had been worked out. And so uh, we will follow up to make sure that that protocol is being followed, that they receive packets during that time of quarantine. Is there a reason why students are not being allowed to have individual devices to participate in their education during quarantine? Yeah, so I can answer that. And just also, they, they are getting the packets and they are not held for the 14 days if they don't need to be there for the 14 days, just to, to clarify that. That's where the, the uh, time they're held. And then once they can begin to go into uh, groups and into the class if they're there beyond the 14 days. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, the device is part of the the rules with uh, the county that we are trying to work through, right? So it is definitely not something from the piece that we own on the educational um, experience side, but it is part of the piece with the county where the students are not able to have a device in their individual spaces. And so that is the reason why we're doing the paper pencil versions until they're able to come out of quarantine and go into the common classroom spaces. My understanding would be that they usually wouldn't be able to have a, a pencil in their individual spaces. So I'm like, there is some, there's some ad adjustment that that's happening per kind of the, the situation that we're in. Um, I think the other thing to speak to specifically with students in Metro is what we're doing around mental health support for our students um, who experience incarceration as children. Um, and then I have a question that's more general to, to the whole secondary team. Yep. So I would say two things to that. One, it's one of the reasons why we're excited about the collaboration and the partnership that we feel like we're rebuilding to get to the conversation around the device, which I, that's just where we are. And it's a continued conversation. Uh, the mental health, I would say two things. One, um, as Mike mentioned, we have a social worker now, and she is connected directly to all of our programs that fall under the Office of Youth Reengagement. So she's working uh, with them. She's also doing outreach when uh, students may not be attending one of our other programs. And uh, so that social worker is doing some of that. And then in addition to that, we do have uh, some others that we've consulted with that we're working with in the meantime that are providing additional social emotional supports to students, additional restorative circle work, both for the students and staff there as well. Um, so those are a few of the things that we're working on knowing the mental health health piece is critically important for all, but really important for our students that are uh, winding up over at Metro. And then I just want to go back and mention uh, one thing Ananda was asking. Our numbers are low right now, which obviously is a, a really great thing. Um, and I, it potentially is partially due to the pandemic, but our numbers have been much lower uh, this first kind of quarter and a half than they have been in the past. So we've had um, um, many fewer students. And then I know you had another question, Ali, sorry. Thank you so much for speaking to that. And Nikki, I'm sorry, this is my last question. Uh, so I, I think it's really important as we as we adapt to virtual learning that we ha we seem to have prioritized adapting the shift in, in work. And I guess, uh, you know, for, for little kids, you wonder how something like recess translates, right, to virtual learning. For older kids, you wonder about things like field trips or celebratory experiences or study abroad, um, the things that kind of make going high school thrill, going to high school pretty thrilling. Um, and so I'm wondering what, what we're doing to um, celebrate kids when they're being successful. And I know that I see teachers going above and beyond on this front all the time in terms of how to say like, you made the honor roll and, and these sorts of things. Um, but are there some things we're doing kind of district wide that are celebrating and recognizing uh, the work of our students and kind of the milestones within achievement for our young people? I think one of the ways that we're, we're I'm sorry, Dr. Brad. I yield. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ways is that we're trying to utilize social media much more. Um, uh, and uh, 
I also know that there are, are many elementary <laughs> schools um, that are, are setting up just some social times in which kids are getting together and play games and to do to those. We're starting to see an uptick in numbers of clubs for the high schools right now, which there, there are adults that are, are the club advisors as well, but students are getting together, whether it is a gaming club. Um, I was just over at Memorial and I was talking with some students in which they're talking about a math league um, club, just talking about math, right? It's just one of those things, but we're trying to utilize those as some, some additional resources and celebrations. Dr. <coughs> And, and I just wanted to add to that, that is uh, uh, a conversation that is being held right now for our building level leaders. Um, I am constantly pushing uh, to elevate the positive things that are happening in schools, not only for our students, but for our teachers as well. I, I do think that it becomes contagious as we lift the positive, as, the positive aspects of this virtual environment that we're in. I, I think it brings a sense of normalcy uh, to, to the work. And so I've been pushing for us to come up with a matrix that we will all follow across the board to recognize like student of the week, teacher of the week, um, you know, citizen of the week, whatever they can come up with. I just think that there's power in, um, in, in elevating uh, the positives that, that, we, that we have going on. I was, um, you know, and, and along the same lines, uh, one of my school visits uh, last week, and, and I went to, and I was able to drop in and see the interaction between the teacher and the students after the um, Thanksgiving holidays. And, you know, how the teachers paused to just reflect on the holidays, talking about what they had for dinner and everybody was sharing all of the dishes that they were doing. And so elevated from that conversation was next week, we're going to have a show and tell of a dish that you created on your own at home. And all the kids were just so excited about it, chiming in and talking about what they were going to create. And I, I just think there's a special need for that. When we talk about social emotional piece, when you talk about little kids on the playground, the absence of that, we have to figure out ways to, to fill that space. I recommended it to a school today. I was doing a school visit and they had a wonderful thing um, going on over at La Follette where they were talking about kids on an individual basis, trying to uh, really pinpoint the level of support individual students needed, right? And it was elevated amongst the team that we don't know our ninth graders. And I applaud them, first of all, for acknowledging that they, they don't know their ninth graders because they had not had an opportunity to be in brick and mortar with them. And so we started brainstorming how we could uh, you know, overcome that barrier. And, you know, I said, you know, an online talent show. I said, have them to record their talent, submit it so that you can control what is being elevated and then invite the whole class in to the talent show. We have to do things like that to kind of build those relationships like that and elevate each other. And so, yes, uh, the question that you elevated is, is relevant and it's something that we need to do systemically across the board. Thank I would you. just I would just add that we are doing uh, stuff to celebrate our seniors because we know what a pivotal time this is. I know Dr. Pryor touched it a little, but it is something in addition to all of our other students that we're continuously uh, trying to highlight throughout this entire year and support simultaneously. I certainly appreciate that. Um, Ali, I think you are done. Uh, Nikki? Yep. Um, one, I'd want to thank our community partners and our local organizations for really stepping up in virtual learning. I think that's huge. A lot of the virtual tutoring could not be done without this help. And I'm really excited about that and give a shout out to that as without it, we would not be where we're at. As for um, Metro, uh, just for info sake, um, the only people who are allowed in Metro are the act actual staff currently because of COVID, even the lawyers have a hard time getting in um, because of uh, safety protocol, because of the, because their staff can't leave. So to protect their staff, they've limited who could come in and almost all visits are virtual. As for the uh, computer issue, the jail and I have gone back and forth multiple times 
and they have been made aware that the ADA is federal law and that security blocking software can be added, but that they can't prevent, completely prevent computerized services from occurring because of an IEP. And there have been court rulings on that and I can get that to anyone if they need that because this is an issue I've dealt quite a bit with. And these kids are our students. They deserve the right like anyone else. I don't like that they can't have it in their cells. I can't call them rooms, Mike. I wish I could, but they're not. And that's just something I can't normalize. My mind won't let me do that. But very simply, educationally, we need to provide those services and oftentimes those get missed. So I really thank Dr. Pryor and Dr. Jenkins and Mike and everyone for actually making steps to fix this because it's been a long time coming. Thank you, thank you Nikki. Any comments? Um, any of my colleagues have any other questions? Yeah, Gloria and, okay, go ahead, Gloria. Great, thank you, Ananda. Uh, and thank you for this presentation. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I really like that slide um, in the work around targeted student interventions. Um, that's something I've been talking about for some time. Um, and just wondering, how, do we have the data of how many we have been able to re-engage uh, during those uh, supports? If we don't have the data now, uh, I would like to see it. Mike, did you have something? Yeah, right now we're, we're collecting it. It's two to three weeks in. Um, uh, I just pulled up the, the spreadsheet for for East and we have a list of students that are, are attending and who the adults that are working with. If we look at the, the um, La Follette model, and we're seeing the same thing. So we're now seeing some, the touch points and we're gonna see where it goes. So it's gonna be a few more weeks, but yes, we can get you that data. The data that I spoke on of the 75% of the students that are working right now at Capitol, uh, Quinn and Karen have those numbers. And then they did the cross-reference of who is actually earning the credit. We have that and like I said, one of the results then is now we're discussing on how we might be able to take attendance in a different way. We can get you that data too, because that the attendance or the engagement Data was a, a, a little bit misleading when we see that they were, I'm, I might be making this, they were about 60%, 80% um, uh, or lower, but their students were earning credit and that's why it was a panic mode when we saw this. And now we're seeing why. And when you're talking to particular students saying, we need to work as well to help our families pay our rent or you know doing those things. And so we, we needed to adjust as well. We would do that when we were in person. And it's insane to say we wouldn't do that virtually, but we can get that data to you, but it's just gonna take a little bit of time um, uh, because re-engagement and then work, providing the work, those two things will go hand in hand and um, um, the quarter will end in a few weeks, some, or semester will end um, um, the end of January. So we'll see through that. Great, thank you for that, Mike. And do we, um the kids who are students who we haven't engaged at all for whatever reason. Um, that data too, I mean, I, I, I and just would like to know what the percentage of those um, students are that, you know, they're not, we haven't been able to re-engage them. They are still, uh, you know, missing in action. <laughs> so one of the charges and I don't want to speak out of turn. So if Dr. Pryor, Cindy, if you want to add anything on here is through RPO and, and um, Chelsea's work, we were actually able to drill down and get names and percentages of attendance. And then we, we talked with individual schools and the, the principals went with the SSIT team, the student services team. And then they were able to go through and identify every student and what interventions are working or are not working. And then from there, they're drilling in deeper to see, all right, understanding until the 16th, the, the home visits, but still trying to think of other ways 
I know that schools are looking at every possible social media name that the, the students might have through Snapchat or Instagram, and just reaching out, looking at who talks with Mike Hernandez. Can they reach out to them and, and see? Um, it's, it's something in which we're, we're working extremely in a different way. Do we have that data yet? I know that um, I was with O'Keefe today and Tony or Mr. Duga was able to identify a handful of students. And when we were doing site visits, we were able to see some of those students that they just reached out because no one had reached out to them yet. Mm -hmm. And once they got the calls from the head principal, which can be powerful, saying, we really want to see you in school, the student then started to attend the school. And then when he's popping into class to say hello to him, just to see how he's doing, the impact, now by design or by, by scale, the high schools have a larger number of students that are disengaged. So we're thinking of different ways in which how we can do this. And I think that part of what is going to be a benefit too is of that expanded list uh, of our partners that, that we're pointing out on is, is trying to remember we can't do this by ourselves. Mm-hmm. We have to be able to um, trust our partners who we have an agreement, the, the mid or high level, that who we have an agreement to, to reach out and talk to, to try to find other ways to reach in and connect in with our students. That's great, uh, Mike. And that leads to my next um, part, my next few questions is, you know, our partners, um, Dr. Jenkins and I, um, we uh, convened a group of uh, uh, CEOs uh, of nonprofits and really uh, working through and talking about our COVID response and recovery. And we spent some time talking about how we were in crisis mode at the beginning of COVID, uh, really just doing whatever we could. Uh, Many partners stepped in to uh, just support the basic needs of our families. And now we are moving towards this sort of uh, space of recovery and what that looks like. uh, many um, the partner our partners who were in the room, um, you know, really talked about how the impact of their own uh, staff um, in this work, and so uh, I'm really happy to see that you all are also looking at uh, the the social emotional uh, or the emotional component of our staff here uh, because it's very similar into uh, what our um, nonprofit leaders are experiencing as well. And so um, I, I, I sort of feel uh, that this is a, a critical component that our CEOs um, elevated um, in this meeting um, as a, an urgent uh, response. And I feel the same urgency as well. I think that um, uh, we have to figure out a way to support our teachers, our staff, um, our social workers um, across the board during this time. And, and so that when we come out of this, we are, um, you know, we are intact. And, um, and so I, I think that that's going to be important. I, I don't think, um, and we have time, right? We're going to be in the space for a while. Um, and so I think the I'm glad Mikey brought this up because I think there has to be a way of evaluating um, our effectiveness in our partnerships um, during this time. And um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, they're gonna be critical. They're critical, they were critical uh, during crisis. They're critical now and they're gonna be critical after. And, um, it's just, we're gonna have to figure out how we um, evaluate their work and it's going to be different than what it was before. And so I just wanted to bring that up. Um, We also, um, Dr. Jenkins and I met with Black Mothers, um, was it this past weekend? It was Uh, Saturday, I think, yeah. Yeah, and you know, Dr. Jenkins, you can add uh, to this, but we, um, we got the real life, you know, experience, right? I mean, it was real, (laughs) like, and uh, that is what we need to hear um, all, every day, right? It is um, in order for us to move forward and how this impacts our, our, our black mothers um, who are 
you know, uh, single raising kids, working two or three jobs. And I, I know we keep saying this, but I think, you know, hearing it from, uh, from them is so critical and then bringing it into the space is also important. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to um, bring that up, but um, yeah. Dr. Jacobs, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, just the one thing on the mothers that we met with on Saturday, uh, I, first of all, I have to give so many kudos to Ms. J uh, at Leopold who organized this. And then we also had the principal, assistant principal from Frank Alice. But these mothers spoke. We should have recorded it. Um, and they also, in their speaking, spoke from the heart of a mother, which transcended anything else. These were African-American women who were speaking that would have made any and all of us proud. But they also brought something to light about how they want to be partners. It's not just on the schools. And the one mother with multiple children who are, she's in school herself and schools four days a week, Monday through Thursday and works Friday through Sunday, doesn't have any additional time. But she said, even in that, when she finds time, she wants to support her children in the schools. So the narrative that the parents, we can't connect, but sometimes they don't want to help or they can't help. These parents are saying the opposite. Say, they said that they want to. And this is where, when we were talking about, we have to reach differently than just surveys. Sometimes the electronic surveys don't get it. We're not hearing from our parents that we really need to. So I think the principal, Ms. I think it's Ms. Keeler over there. I'm still learning everybody's name, right? Um, over there in the way that she engaged her parents and uh, also Ms. Terrell, uh, Candace Terrell, principal at Frank Alice for stepping out with our parents. And uh, I'll speak at the end about a little bit about what this group is doing, but thank you guys so far for all the things that you've said and the work that we're doing that doesn't sometimes get elevated. And our teachers are going above and beyond, but parents too are going above and beyond during this time. Yeah, and it, 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 oh. just to add that, I mean, I think it does, they spoke a lot about um, just having to, to change the way things were done, right? It is, it's no longer, no, we can't do that anymore, right? It is, it is having support systems within our schools who are, who are innovating, who are changing things up um, to make things, um, you know, uh, better. And so I think they they spoke on that on on how important that is of saying no, uh, we can't because we haven't. Instead of saying you know, instead really focusing on, yeah, we, we'll figure that out. We'll work with you on that, um, Cindy. Yeah, I was just going to add to what uh, you and Dr. Jenkins were saying in the point that I think that same thing goes for our high school students. We have so many of our high school students that are wage earners in their household or the only wage earner in their household. They are caretakers of their brothers and sisters or other members in their household. So this idea of how our, our students are able to show mastery of courses and are able to demonstrate their learning has really made us think differently about uh, and the flexibility that we need to provide that I would say some of that is uh, is really what we should take back to brick and mortar to think about the flexibility and also how we've been thinking about students earning credit from our work-based experience practices and stuff like that. So I just wanted to highlight that our, our young adults that are in our buildings are in similar places where we really need to think about that uh, flexibility and, and how they demonstrate learning. So elevating the voices, if I had last thing, the voices of those parents that we had an opportunity to meet with and of our students. And right now, Gloria, uh, she didn't mention that Thursday, we're gonna have uh, another opportunity to meet with parents and we're gonna do it on Facebook Live. And we wanted to involve our board members in it. And then when we do the student portion, which Savion, uh, you've always been a part of that particular piece, working with me. And then we have other board members doing it because we wanna know how are our students being impacted and how are all our parents being impacted. So that's something else that's gonna be coming up in January. Uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. Gloria, are you done? Yeah. Uh, Caruzzi and then Gomez Schmidt. 
No. Thanks, Ananda. Um, I just want to, um, again, echo the gratitude to um, our communities, our staff, our families for all that they're doing to not just support our students learning, but also to support all the things our schools do to make sure that students have what they need to learn, be it food, be it social work, um, all the support our kids need. You know, the gratitude I have for our community organizations is pretty intense. We couldn't do this without them. Um, I wanted to um, get into um, a couple of the challenges that were raised in this presentation, specifically around students and staff. Um, I really appreciate um, Mr. Hernandez um, calling out um, the, or Dr. Pryor actually calling out the challenges the freshmen are facing, trying to start high school virtually. And um, Cindy, I also very much appreciate what you had to say about our seniors um, who have not only sacrificed their senior year, but a good chunk of their junior year um, thus far to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, it's a big ask of kids. And um, I think that's a real challenge of students that we have to constantly acknowledge um, how much these kids are giving up to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, when it comes to juniors um, and also seniors to some degree who are have dreams of going to college, there's an extra layer of um, uncertainty that kids are facing. And I'm not sure how much um, MMSD can do to try to alleviate some of that. For kids whose college dreams depend on aid, be it athletic scholarships or merit aid or need-based aid, an awful lot of them are going to need to have ACT scores. Even if colleges are waiving those ATCT scores for admission, a lot of them are still gonna require them for aid. And um, juniors have not heard anything about whether or not MMSD is going to offer the ACT this year or the PSAT. And that's um, causing families a whole lot of uncertainty about um, you know, whether their kids are gonna be able to take these tests at all or for families who have more privilege, how far and how much they're willing to spend to get those kids tested someplace else so they'll have opportunities. So this uh, creates all sorts of issues around equity um, as well as our ability to support children who have dreams of college and need to be able to jump through certain hoops to make those dreams come true. Um, I'm wondering when we might be able to communicate to families um, more information about um, when we might be able to offer the ACT to um, students who are hoping to go to college and you know who are going to need that aid to be able to make it happen. And I know athletics is a much, much more complicated question because of COVID, but we do have a lot of families and kids who are not only struggling because athletics was such an important part of their lives and it's gone, but who are hoping for athletic scholarships to make college happen and are um, potential, at least feeling like they might be losing those opportunities because of COVID. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak to that. And then I do have some comments about challenges faced by staffed, by our staff. Yeah, um, we should be getting information out about the PSAT. Now uh, we've been working with some of our local um, Dane County schools as well uh, on, on some of the challenges of being able to provide proctors and then keeping students safely away if it's a large number of students signing up for. Um, Dr. Pryor and I met with the high school people and we're organizing a plan now that we'll be presenting um, to Lisa, to Dr. Jenkins and Dr. McGregory. Um, um, and then we're hoping to be able to get that information out to families ASAP. I know myself, I'm filling out, I've filled out the FAFSA and stuff for my daughter. And there is a challenge without an, an ATC, ACT score, but reaching out to, to schools because Many of you know me, I'm fairly anal about stuff and I kind of get into it deep and I, I'm just bugging people asking them about, well, what, how is this going to hurt or help and whatnot. Um, um, schools are, that are waiving these ACTs, um, it, it isn't necessarily affecting the, the financial aid component, but it's a one year. So Chris, you're absolutely right. It could be the extension of the following several years. Um, uh, again, it's one of those in which I'm... Um, um, how we might be able to, to provide the assessments in a safe setting. And uh, in using our gyms, it's still, we couldn't use, put more than 25 students in a large, large field house. We could put 25 students in a science lab or 25 in the, in the field house. So we're just trying to work through that as well. Ma, but we're hoping to have some plans. We do have a little bit with the PSAT speaking to them for the national merit. Um, we were told that families can use the SAT score um, in place of the PSAT if they want, but you still have to take the assessment. Um, um, 
There are people that are going as far as Iowa um, to take the SAT because there's no one around here right now that is given the SAT. Um, and so we're trying to work through that to be able to provide opportunities um, for, our, for our students in extension to the families um, uh, for this. So it's not taken lightly. Um, we will get that communication out. I think, Cindy, we just came out with the, the deadline. Um, um, and, and then we will get that information to our account. We just sent it to the counselors and then we'll be presenting our plan. Thanks for that. And I, um, likewise, I think any communications we can make about spring athletics, um, as soon as we can do that, you know, parents and kids just want to know. Yeah. What's going on. You know, for a lot of kids, athletics is so integral to their identity and yep. losing it is hard. So just making sure they know what's going on will help. Yes, ma'am. Um, when it comes to staff, um, you know, I, I, I want to echo the appreciation for all the many, many roles our staff are playing right now that, um, you know, in addition to just shifting their curriculum to a virtual platform, you know, you you very clearly laid out all the things that our staff are doing on top of that to embrace our kids and make sure they don't slip through the cracks right now. And, um, you know, our staff are giving 500% and I deeply appreciate that. And at the same time, I think we as a board need to be very aware of staff burnout and the very real chance that we may have some amazing teachers who give up this year who say I gave 500% and I am fried and I can't, I need to find a new job. I need to find a new profession. I'm very, very concerned about that. Um, and um, I'm wondering, you know, specifically what we can do to address the challenges of staff burnout. Um, one of the things I'm hearing loud and clear from staff is that the support they're providing to children really can't, like they have to do it. They can't let that go. But some of the time that goes into professional development and meetings um, they could, they would, you know, like to see maybe some of that let up a little bit so they could spend more of that time helping kids and doing their, you know, mentoring and outreach and additional support for kids who need it. So I'm wondering if um, you could speak to us a little bit about what the plan is first, you know, I know we've done very intense staff professional development around virtual learning. And if there's any chance that maybe the intensity of that professional development might let up a little bit to free up some of our staff's time to just, you know, do all the extra work that they're doing to help kids right now. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. I could probably respond first to that and appreciate you elevating that question because that is um, of great importance. Um, I, I would yield to say that um, based on survey data that we received back from teachers, directly from teachers, in regards to some of the challenges that they were experiencing around first quarter that was submitted to us, we carefully reviewed uh, their feedback and we made some shifts. Um, <clears throat> the primary challenge was around the asynchronous day on Wednesdays. You know, and they were very intentional in pointing out what was really absorbing most of their time, like the attendance piece, uh, taking that multiple times throughout the day, right? Um, they, um, they even talked about uh, where some students were actually receiving additional work, you know, or new work on those days, and some teachers were doing that. And so when we compiled all the data and asked them what are the shifts that they would like to see us make, you know, they just pointed out that they wanted flexibility on Wednesdays. I, um, be honest with you, there wasn't a lot of pushback in regards to professional development time. In actuality, a lot of teachers were actually reaching out for more collaboration time, you know, with colleagues to uh, really figure out a way to do this work better. And so <clears throat> I will, um, I share a personal story. I, I keep my pulse on that in every school visit I make. One of the first questions I ask the principal is, um, you know, how are your teachers? You know, what's the pulse like? Have you been checking in with them, acknowledging the work they're doing? You know, it's something to say about intrinsic value. You know, a, a simple thank you and I appreciate the work that you're doing. You usually give those individuals, the good ones anyway, that boost that they need to keep moving forward. It's not easy. And I totally agree with you. I'm in a household of educators. Um, myself, my wife, she's an educator. Having a little one in school, I know the lift that is required. Um, and, and so, you know, we lean on our principals, our building level leaders to keep a pulse on that 
and know those shifts to make in their staff to make sure that they don't reach that point of burnout, not overloading them with so many things that they get to that point. And so uh, the point that you raise, yes, we have to keep that on our radar and keep the communication going with our staff to ensure that we don't reach that point. Thanks, that's all of my questions. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I appreciate you elevating the the staff um, uh, staff capacity, uh, staff burned out, uh, staff resilience, uh, and thank you, uh, Mike, for for making the point to add that in our presentation. Um, I will send an email pretty soon to 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 both of you. Uh, sharing a work uh, from one of my colleagues at DPI around compassion fatigue. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's, it's maybe a couple of years old, that work. Uh, what I found to be, and today actually we happen to have a presentation about it because it, you know, it's more relevant than ever. Um, it includes an assessment that even just doing the assessment and just kind of calling things out, it was, it was helpful to me to to ground on those things. So I'll share those resources. Um, but thank you so much, uh, both of you. Uh, uh, Gomez Schmidt. Thanks, Ananda. Um, thank you, Dr. Pryor, um, Mike, and Cindy for this presentation. And I just want to repeat what others have said about my appreciation for you know that list of community partners who are really stepping up to help engage with students and all of the things that our staff is doing also. You know, one of the things I like to highlight is this virtual men mentor model where every staff member in the school is, you know, broken up and taking a number of students. To, just, to stay connected with those students and those families and just how important I have heard that is for engagement. Um, and another thing to highlight, I think Dr. Pryor talked about this is the, the extracurriculars or, or the involvement. Um, and I've, I've talked to a few schools where they've talked about students showing up for these extra opportunities that are a choice and how the engagement is different, like all the cameras are on and the students are talking with each other. And so just trying to think about how we can, I, I don't know if you can replicate that for a class that they have to show up to, but I know one of the challenges is, you know, of a teacher talking to a, a screen full of blank screens where everybody's camera is off and trying to, you know, keep kids engaged and even know if they're there and listening. So I think um, just the, the communication we're doing with families is highly important too. Um, communication with parents as well as students um, because we really know that um, the, the parents and the families are, are a huge part of this in the virtual model too. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have is sort of building off of um, Gloria's <laughs> questions about really understanding the numbers of students that we have affected by these continued challenges um, that you said. So I'm just kind of curious, like from a ballpark perspective. So we're talking about the connectivity issues that we have where students really are struggling to stay connected. Like, do we have a ballpark of how many students that's affecting and um, you know, how much of it is either hotspots or the devices or just a capacity issue that you know, um, we can't necessarily overcome. I can, I, I can give you a ballpark on the, the number of students, but we're still in the midst of collecting the data of the exact rationale of why. We have roughly 800 and change of middle school students and roughly 1650 to 1700 high school students that are less than 80% attendance. Right. And through that, we're, we're beginning to break down the data of the why. Right. Um, uh, unfortunately, one of the reasons of lack of connectivity, um, it, it's hard to gauge because we can't reach them. And so we, we have that and that, that it just lends to have they moved, have they, you know, any of those. And so we're still trying to exhaust ways to reach out. But with that attendance data, um, um, I, I've highlighted capital, but it's the same at, at several of, of the other high schools as well, is some of that attendance, there's still a, a good percentage of kids 
that are earning the credits because they're not going to class during the day, they're going on at night or the weekends and completing that work. And so when we have that all finalized, um, uh, we will get that to, the, to Chelsea and the team so that we can then run I don't know, the report magic that they, they, they do um, uh, to get it in a nice spreadsheet so that we can then send and share it with Dr. Jenkins and then with the board um, uh, because that is something that, I mean, we have some theories, but we want to base some, some, some hard evidence on those theories right now. Yeah, I'll just add to that, uh, Mike, I don't think I heard you say the elementary number. That's like 766 students. And we chose to use the number uh, for attendance. It's like 20% because that means they have logged on at some point. And now we're trying to get to understanding why, why they may have missed at all. And it's totally different. You just can't say they missed 20%. We mentioned it at the high school level, some students taking jobs and it's different kind of ways we're looking at it may be some connectivity issues. And Chelsea Tubbs, uh, as uh, Mr. Hernandez uh, mentioned, have the data on that piece. And I really do appreciate the work that she's doing with the Chiefs. And Gloria um, has been asking since day one, we've been talking about this, our students who just haven't been engaged. And we ran it at the elementary numbers, but the ones who totally haven't been engaged at all, the number drastically drops from that. But we just wanted to look at the ones who still have 20% um, absence because that could lead to uh, some other challenges or other issues going on in the home that we're finding out as well. Thanks, I appreciate that. Because like Gloria said, you know, the urgency that you feel around that and wanting to problem solve around that, I, I think I probably all the board members and all of the staff are feeling that, but um, mm -hmm. definitely happy to support, you know, what is needed to, yeah, really um, to help with any of those issues, um, I guess just let us know. Thank you very much. And, and thank thank you. You. again, thanks to everyone, um, community and staff um, who are stepping up in this really challenging time. Thank you, Chris. Go to Savion and then you, Nikki. Yeah, thank you. Like everyone else, I really want to echo my deep, sincere uh, appreciation and gratitude for our staff and partners who have really stepped up to the plate in this unprecedented time. You know, kind of related to the last conversation, Dr. Jenkins and I have met with a team of social workers and habitual truancy has certainly been um, an, an, an issue, especially in this era of virtual learning and, you know, lack of connectivity. Uh, I, I'm wondering if there's more we can do to kind of share best practices amongst the district social workers and more we can do to empower uh, what they can do to contact families. Oh. Did he, is it done? Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to respond to that. First of all, the social workers, uh, Savion and I both have had an opportunity to meet with them and boy, do they have some great practices going on throughout our district and we're gonna meet with them again tomorrow but as we've been talking about this whole piece and just it makes sense what they said about how we're classifying students as habitually truant during this particular time. And in fact, and as um, Mr. Hen Hernandez mentioned earlier, some of the students are actually not truant. They're just doing their schoolwork at a different time and how we're going about tracking that. And so when we spoke with the social workers and they're wanting us to look at our district policies, and we're even talking about the state uh, and perhaps recommending something not only in the district, but also throughout the state because students are having some different times with the whole fact that they are also the individual at home taking care of the younger siblings, they're working, all these other things. And so our social workers, we've been talking about a lot of people, but our social workers and nurses too have just really gone above and beyond. And they're thinking tra transformatively, not just for COVID, how some of the policies around attendance and trying to be an anti-racist district, they've highlighted a few things to myself and to uh, Savion that I was like, wow, this is great. We have to continue with this type of thinking, uh, thinking right now. So thank you, Savion, for bringing that up. Thank you, Savion. Uh, Nikki? Yes. Um just for the disability perspective, I, the reason I'm for the not having cameras on is I have a lot of 
clients with anxiety issues who get very, very nervous when being on screen. It's just something that they they do have. And so I, I like the option for that reason. I'm afraid that if we, as much as I wish people would turn it on, I understand there are things like poverty, disability, stuff like that, where someone may not be comfortable. And I understand how frustrating it has to be, but I, I could kind of see both sides on that, but I think you bring up a good point, Chris. <laughs> As for the teachers, we need to do more for them, in my opinion. And I would love to talk with Chris on more things that we can do, more enrichment activities, more, more ways. And when I say teachers, I mean support staff, I mean BEAs, I mean SEAs, and I mean classroom teachers. I put them in one category. I need to learn to differentiate between them and I don't do that. So I wanted to clarify that. But one of the things we can do is in January for next year is to build in COLA into the budget. I think that's the best way you can do it. That's me. And that, But I'd love to have any other suggestions on how we can do it non-monetarily to make it <laughs> an excellent working environment because that's the most important is our teachers are giving 110%. So I think we can get creative, even in a non-monetary sense. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, is the team ready to go to the next part? Thank you. We are ready for the second half. Barb, could you share your screen again? Could you uh, skip to the next slide? And could you go one more, please? Right here, thank you. All right, so that was a great conversation. And now I'm looking forward to uh, some more updates around uh, secondary, specifically our personalized pathways. Um, and I always like to start with this slide because I think it's critically important to understand that this is not a school district strategy. This is a regional approach and a regional strategy that we embarked on with all of these partners uh, really about six, seven years ago. And we started with uh, a few of these partners. We started with the chamber, the city, uh, Madison College and Workforce Development Board to think about kind of uh, the conceptualizing of personalized pathways. And since then, it's grown to these amazing eight partners, and they are are critically important to the work, both from a monetary standpoint, from a human resource standpoint, and just from a support standpoint for our students. They wrap around our students, they're providing opportunities for our student, and we're really thinking about where our students are going once they leave us in MMSD, and how all of our partners are still going to support them, both with post-secondary, as well as, as our students enter into the workforce. So this is definitely a regional strategy and it's something that we cannot do without all of the um, kind of emblems on the screen. Could you go to the next slide? Thanks. And I always like to talk about our journey. I know we have some new board members. I know we have some wonderful new uh, administrators also. And I think it's important to understand that this uh, journey for personalized pathways has been many years in the making. It started back in 2013-14 with the High School Reform Collaborative, which was a group of 60 members from across our entire city, some that were from our anchor partner agencies, our schools, our students, other community and business industry, um, members. We had board members on it at the time. And that group really helped kind of inform and also design the, the district's personalized pathways. Uh, from there, we uh, actually started with our high schools back in 2016, so four years ago, uh, to really think about the design of our first pathway. Could you go to the next slide, Barb? And then we started to embark on a community of practice, the greater um, uh, 
a community of practice consortium through Great Lakes. And with that, we partnered with four different communities, Rockford, Illinois, Columbus, Ohio, and the Northwest suburbs of Illinois, 211 and 214, to learn together um, around our start of personalized pathways and also had funding with that. And the funding at this moment in time has led to three quarters of a million dollars. So about $750,000 that we have received uh, to continue to support personalized pathways. Next slide, Barb. And so I also think it's important for us to remember how we define pathways and what is pathways in MMSD. Um, Dr. Pryor started off with our graduate vision. Our graduate vision obviously is center for us when we're thinking about our students and preparing them for college, career, and community. All three of those, it's not an or, it's an and. Uh, we also think about pathways as interconnected courses and experiences. We know those interdisciplinary connections and those connections across our classes, along with the kind of uh, themed projects that happen are really important. All of that also being driven by students' academic and career plans or their college and career plans, where they are going post high school life. Um, ensuring that we're setting every one of our students up for that post-secondary plan, ensuring that they are leading to uh, industry certification, if that is what they so choose, ensuring that we are leading them to the most prestigious institution, if that's what they so choose, or wherever they choose to go post-secondary, that we will uh, prepare them for that path. Next slide, Barb. And so our guiding principles, again, just a reminder of the guiding principles that we set forth that we're constantly pressure testing against to ensure that our current design is meeting these guiding principles and also reflecting along the way or adjusting as needed when they may not be meeting these guiding principles. Um, the post-secondary vision, obviously critically important, ensuring that the uh, quality coursework and instruction is rigorous, uh, that flexible scheduling piece is really important, not just for coursework that leads to early college opportunities, but that flexible scheduling that can also provide more opportunities for experiential learning is really important. And uh, really thinking about those small learning communities uh, in the positive relationships and uh, the small networks of students and teachers together that are getting to know each other very well is really important for our guiding principles. And so fi finally, the kind of five components that make up our model are these right here. I've talked about them before, but just to reiterate that academic and career planning, making sure uh, students are reflecting on who they are, where they're going, how they're going to get there, and how we're going to help them get there as they're thinking about life after high school that is critically important to this work, thinking about those uh, uh, core studies or that uh, program of study that leads students to all of those experiences to get them to successful post high school life, uh, supports to wrap around our students to ensure that they're taken care of while they're with us and as they leave us those experiential learning opportunities that could be anything from a job shadow all the way up to youth apprenticeship. And then that small learning community where teachers and students know each other really well and are uh, working together on their experiences. So we're gonna spend some time digging into data. We won't look at all of the data, obviously, that you received in that, um, multi-page report. What I want to highlight is we know that there were a few questions from board members around some additional data. That data we're working on right now, and we'll make sure that you receive that data later this week. Uh, we acknowledge that. We also appreciate the data questions that you ask. Some of the data questions that you ask are things that we're constantly thinking about. Um, the other thing that I would say as I go through these slides and talk about some of the uh, things that have happened to date and what we're learning, 
we are really excited about um, reconceptualizing and rethinking our current model to ensure that we are always adjusting to meet the needs of our students to think about where we're going. We know we have a new leader here, so it's important for us to ensure that our new leader's vision is part of it. We've got Dr. Pryor that has experience with uh, Pathways. We've got Dr. McGregory. So we have a whole new group of wonderful people that are going to help us um, as we're refining and rethinking our work along the way. So I just wanted to mention that before we dive into the data. Barb, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. So who are our students in Pathways? So again, we have our data here that shows all of the students, um, starting with our first year of implementation, which was 2017-18, all the way up through end of year last year. Uh, we're definitely working on getting you some of the data for who's in our pathways this year, but you can see who our students are right now. And you can see that we have a large number of students of color in our pathway, and we also have uh, students that are from low income backgrounds, as well as students that represent our overall high school populations. Could you go to the next slide, please, Barb? And so the focus that we're going to have on our data tonight is based on our, our uh, uh, propensity score match that we did three years ago when Pathways launched. Um, we wanted to spend time on this data because it's the data that we have uh, for the longest period of time and data that we thought was really relevant for conversations. Uh, when we started this out, we had students that were uh, match to their liked peers. And the match was done by GPA, attendance, and demographics. And the analysis that you'll see is for only students that had enrollment in 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. And right here, you can see the uh, pathway students and their match comparison group. A few of the highlights for uh, our students and their match comparison group are that the students in the pathway showed higher rates of academic engagement than their students that are not in the pathways. Our match students in the pathway showed similar rates of academic achievement. So pretty comparable to the students that are not in the pathway. Uh, yet our students that identify as black that are in the pathway show higher rates of both academic achievement and engagement to their uh, liked peers that are not in the pathway. So here you'll see overall for academic engagement and academic engagement we define as attendance. The blue represents our students that are in pathways. The orange represents that matched comparison group. And then you'll see, maybe you will see, if you could see it closely, a faint gray line, which is all other students. Could you go to the next slide, Barb? Okay, thanks, sorry, I was trying to toggle between uh, my slides and your slides. <laughs> so thank you. So on this slide, you'll see our match comparison, the academic engagement, and you'll notice that students in a pathway um, earned slightly more credits than those students that were not in a pathway. And again, slightly more. If you could go to the next slide. The next slide shows match comparison, again, academic engagement as we're thinking about advanced coursework. So on average, students that were in a pathway were more likely first to take an advanced course and earn advanced course credit compared to their matched peers. The advanced coursework to how we define it as a reminder is everything from advanced placement, um, honors, earned honors, and all of our early college opportunities. Could you go to the next slide, Barb? Thanks.
Uh, so this one is uh, based on course failure. So students that were in a pathway had lower rates of uh, course failure than their matched peers in 17, 18. But then in 18, 19, it was pretty comparable. The rates were similar. Again, you see it overall and by high school. Next slide, Barb. So then we wanted to look specifically at our black students, our students that identify as black to see what the data looked like for, for uh, those students. And so what you will see here is our black students that uh, are in a pathway displayed higher rates of both academic achievement and academic engagement than their matched peers. I wanna point out a few things when we think about attendance. I know we've talked about this in the past in terms of what does that percent of attendance really mean? And the percent of attendance for that first 9% difference is roughly 16 additional days. So that's a significant amount of days. When we think about that, that's three weeks in terms of school weeks, right? And then that 6% difference is roughly 11 days. So that's a significant amount there also two weeks. So when we think about those percentages and what is happening with our students in the pathway uh, versus their matched peers, that, that, that's some real differences there. Similarly, we wanted to look at our students that are, are English language learners and how they were doing in the pathway compared to their matched peers. You'll notice that there's similar rates of academic engagement, and they actually do have some lower rates of academic achievement over the last few years. You'll notice if you look at it by school, uh, it varies a little. You can go to the next slide, Barb, thanks. Similarly, we wanted to also look at our students that uh, come from low income backgrounds and our students from the low income backgrounds had higher rates of academic engagement than their match peers. You can go to the next slide bar. Students with disability, we also wanted to look at our students with disabilities to see what was happening for their progress in the pathway. They had similar rates of academic engagement and academic achievement. All right, so in addition to that, one of the things that we thought was critically important was to highlight some of the opportunities that we've been able to create and really expand, not only due to the implementation of personalized pathways, but more importantly, due to our strong partnership with our post-secondary institutions. And so what you will see on this slide here are some of our early college opportunities that our students have been able to take advantage of and how they are growing over the years as our students are matriculating up through the grades. The first one is a nursing assistant where students are able to leave high school with two degrees in hand, right? They leave with an industry cert as a CNA and also their high school diploma. And you'll notice just between last year and this year, we've been able to double those numbers. And that is really not only to our partnership, but due to our students that are in the pathway. We've also been able to grow opportunities. So the other opportunities you'll see below, everything from our students uh, taking coursework and learning how to be a phlebotomist to our fire academy, to our emergency uh, medical responder, those now are all opportunities that our, our students in high school are taking advantage of and are growing uh, as we are building out our partnership and our pathways. And then what you'll also see is one of our courses that our students take in the health services pathways is called medical terminology. And our students um, uh, take that as a dual credit course, meaning they're earning high school credit for that course. And they're also earning three college credits for that course. And those numbers have grown over the last few years. Next slide, please. In addition to that, our students that are in the ITC pathway, the, the information technology communication pathway, they're only sophomores right now, but as they matriculate up through the grades and into next year, we'll have similar opportunities that our students in the health services have. So they'll have a few different opportunities to uh, 
earn an industry certification before they graduate high school. One is an A plus academy, which is really um, more on the infrastructure and tech side of the house. And then also the Microsoft Office suite opportunity to earn an industry certification, which we know as students enter into the job force, a lot of times uh, employers are looking for these skills uh, with our students. Uh, we also have a social media marketing one, which we know is really hot with our young people right now. And so they'll be able to access that opportunity as well. And then in addition to that, on our high school campuses, we have a couple other dual credit courses that students take where they earn high school credit and also are able to earn college credit. Could you go to the next slide, please? And finally, in addition to kind of the specific opportunities, we are continuing to partner with Madison College to build um, dual credit courses within our high school, specific in the areas of math and English. We know that our preparedness data as our students go into post-secondary is not where we want it to be. So we want our students to take as many dual credit courses while in high school that not only earn them that college credit, but better prepare them to persist through post-secondary. So we've been working closely with Madison College on that. We've been having conversations with Edgewood as well. One of our challenges, I would say, is the qualifications that teachers need to teach these courses. So we're continuing to grapple with that and think about ways to work around that so that we can ensure our students receive these opportunities uh, before they leave high school. All of these opportunities I have not mentioned are free of charge for our students, which is a huge game changer for many of our students and families and saves our students and families lots of money if they earn college credit before even stepping outside of our doors. It's a really uh, important game changer to uh, point out. Could you go to the next slide, Barb? Um, okay, just a few more things and then we'll pause for questions. Um, in addition to that, um, as you saw in the graph above, kind of the five components of pathways, one that we find and think is critically important to our model is this idea of uh, experiential learning. So experiential learning uh, has a continuum. We've talked about it in the past, anywhere from having guest speakers all the way leading up to internships and youth apprenticeship. And in this virtual world, we have really tried to ensure our students are still receiving experiential learning opportunities. Anything from field trips where they're doing virtual field trips to conferences to guest speakers. I know Ali asked about that in terms of field trips and that's one of the things we've been really focusing on and really excited about the ways that we are learning how to uh, have further uh, reach during uh, the virtual world that will lead to how we can continue some of that in the brick and mortar, right? You don't necessarily have to physically go to a job site to have an experience, how we can learn from this virtual time uh, to expand that as we get back into the brick and mortar. Some of the specific ones are listed here. Our students participated virtually in the Wisconsin Leadership Summit, which they have enjoyed and have uh, done for the last few years. Uh, many of our students attended a Black Women's Wellness Conference, those in our health services pathways. Uh, the collaboration happened across our school, so our schools were really able to work together to think about how to plan for some of these opportunities for our students. Could you go to the next slide, Barb? And finally, youth apprenticeship. So we know that uh, even beyond personalized pathways, we have students that are able to uh, take enough coursework and enough experience that lead them to a youth apprenticeship while still in high school. What you'll see here is we have many students that are in the pre-apprenticeship and fewer students that make it actually to the youth apprenticeship. That is for a variety of reasons, sometimes choice, sometimes the options may or may not be available with our employer, sometimes scheduling, uh, very different things. Uh, but we're excited about all the partnerships that we currently have and our students being able to uh, experience youth apprenticeship. The other thing I would point out is that you'll see a dip from 1920 to 2021. And most of that unfortunately is due to COVID. This is one of the real effects that COVID is having on some of our experiences for our students. There's just certain 
uh, business and industry where students just are not able to access right now. So we aren't able to provide all of the opportunities that we can in a brick and mortar. Can you go to the next slide, Barb? All right, so that leads us to a few of our celebrations and our opportunities for uh, kind of uh, future planning. Uh, first, we have our first cohort graduating this spring, which we're really excited about. Uh, this will be our students in the health services. They have gone through four years of the first pathway. So we really want to be able to acknowledge and celebrate our first cohort that is graduating. As I already mentioned, we are really using this opportunity also to rethink experiential learning, rethink expansion of reach, and how as we get back into brick and mortar, we can hold on to uh, some of these wonderful uh, practices that we've learned in virtual and continue those so students still will have a wealth of experiences. We also want to really think about how the future of uh, Pathways is going to align with our facilities referendum work. We're super excited about the referendum that passed. We're excited about the facilities work that's going to happen across our comprehensive high schools. And we really want to ensure that all of this lines up with the experiences we want students to have day to day and the experiences that lead them to be better prepared for post high school life. We're beginning to uh, kind of do our planning again with our high schools and our high school school communities uh, to think about what feedback um, they have on current state of personalized pathways, what we've learned along the way, and how we want to uh, move forward with full implementation, really rethinking everything to make sure that we're going to get it just right. Um, and the last thing I would say is that we really want to think about this from a systemic approach versus just a programmatic approach. So because of the way we've had to implement pathways, we definitely have some hiccups and some bumps along the way. And as we get to kind of full systems approach, we're excited about what that will mean for all of our schools and for our students. Can you go to the next slide, please? And the last slide here, we have an updated and potential timeline. Again, as I opened at the beginning, we're really excited about not only our new leadership, but what we've learned now that we will be uh, graduating our first cohort. We also have a lot that we still need to learn. None of our students in the personalized pathways have yet to go to post-secondary. And we know a piece of this model is really about what it means for them for life after high school. So we're excited to continue to follow our students. We're excited to continue to work with our anchor partners um, as we are all wrapping around and supporting our students for really uh, successful post-high school life and leading to life-sustaining wages. Um, so our timeline looks like this, and we will continue to uh, get feedback from our schools, our stakeholders, and adjust accordingly and refine accordingly. Can you go to the next slide, Barb? All right, so that was a lot of me talking. I'm going to pause real quick to see if Mike and Marvin want to chime in. And then Ananda, I say we open it up for questions after that. Now, I, I just want one thank you, Cindy, for going through this. Um, I know that one of the things that we're also doing is conducting a retreat with our high school principals um, uh, to begin thinking and, and hearing from them as well, just as we start thinking about the planning phases. Dr. Pryor. Also, also, I would like to say thank you, uh, Cindy. Um, I really admire your passion for this work. Um, also to Mike, before we get off tonight, I just want to thank you for all the contributions that you made tonight. Your insight on this work is unparalleled. And so I want to acknowledge that. I, I think that um, Cindy did a, a great job acknowledging this. And I, as I stated earlier, this is so personal uh, to me because this has been the nature of my work for about 11 years in the Atlanta area. As I stated earlier, this is a state uh, requirement that all of our kids engage in a pathway, identified pathway in the ninth grade year. And then they have three consecutive years of work in that pathway with options of becoming certified. Um, we don't look at this as a either or, we look at this or uh, uh, this and, if you will. Uh, many of our students who engage, engage in the pathways 
they go on to four-year uh, colleges and universities to continue their study. But they, they shave off a lot of time on that pathway by the experiences that they've gained in the studies and, and these pathways. You know, I heard some articulation early on in this presentation talking about uh, partnerships in the community. You know, and I have to say that, you know, the time is right. Our, our business community is just as ready as our community partners that we have. And I honestly believe that. And I say that with the spirit of, you know, when I reflect on the pathways in my work, there's been the community, I mean, uh, districts that have gone that extra mile and created what I call these hubs or these centers where uh, the business community stepped up in a big way and provided these facilities so that students in the learning process, they, they trained and uh, was um, privy to industry standard equipment that they worked on. So when they graduated from high school, there wasn't a learning curve for this work. I do see this. I know one of the conversations I had with Dr. Jenkins in that vision about, you know, having a, a center as such and the daytime is for students and the night is for elevating parents you know, helping them become self-sufficient and better producers for their families. Um, but, you know, I, I had to read uh, goal, strategic goal number one. And when it says college, career, and community ready, as Sydney pointed out, there wasn't a pause, college or career or community. We made a commitment to the community for all. And so, as I see this as an equity strategy, I also see this as a gateway to the promise that we've made to our students and our community to ensure that our kids leave us with viable options. This is a wonderful program. It's an expensive program. So I, I applaud Madison for taking this on because you know, uh, from where I'm from, it was all you know the state and, and, and business industry. And, um, I just have to say this because one of the challenges that we had when we ventured this work was with the mindset of communities. We had our most affluent communities that looked and frowned upon these pathways as though they were subpar to four year and two year uh, college experiences. And it was not until we brought in industry people um, so in the uh, business community, the chamber, and they started talking about forecasting and they shared what the job market would look like four or five years down the road and where the critical needs were going to be. And when we realized that we were offering those pathways for students to fill those gaps that exist in the void that was going to exist, you know, the uh, communities really started to embrace that and rally around um, this opportunity and saw it as viable options for our students. And so, you know, um, when I reflect on the referenda, as to how the community stepped up in a powerful way. As I, I listened tonight about this opportunity and our vision for the future, I would just challenge the board and I challenge everybody on this platform to really think beyond the now and think about what life's look like for our students in the future and what role can we play in elevating them to be productive citizens in our society so that when they truly leave us, they're truly ready for college, career, and community. And so with that, I, again, I say thank you, Sydney, for sharing um, tonight. I just would add, uh, we did put an appendix in uh, the slide deck, and I don't know if everyone uh, saw it before, but to Dr. Pryor's point is uh, we did uh, provide the labor market information um, that we've been working on both with Workforce Development Board and our chamber as additional resources uh, for everyone to see as we're thinking about the future. So thanks. I'll turn it to you. Anna. One last thing. Um, and and I, I challenge all of you to do this. And I understand that you've already gone and viewed uh, facilities before and programs before. But I, I challenge you to um, explore Rockdale County Career Academy. You can Google it, Rockdale County Career Academy. And um, just see some of the things that they're doing there. It is mind blowing. The center is such that it runs itself and finance itself with um, things that they have in there and it's student, student ran and student led. And so I challenge you to go look, look at that and I'll see if I can put it in the chat if we have a chat. But anyway, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pryor. Thank you so much, great, uh, Cindy, for uh, this, this great presentation. Uh, I wanted to kick us out with just a couple of comments. Um, I think I don't make any excuses of being a supporter of Pathways. Uh, I had an opportunity along with uh, my colleague Ali Modro to, to go to LA and uh, talk to other board members in particular that I thought that was really helpful uh, and to get a, a, a comprehensive presentation. Uh, I think the struggle that we have had uh, in during the implementation is at that time, Madison was still uh, negotiating our centering on, on targeted uh, strategies. In other words, we were still like, okay, is this for students of color? Maybe, maybe not. Is this a universal strategy? And really uh, not being not being clear uh, to our community uh, what what is it really what we're trying to do. And to your point, Dr. Pryor, is it very expensive investment? And so when I look at the when I look at this data, I'm I feel mixed because I see. I see some some dips in in some of the um, indicators uh, um, between the first year and the second year, uh, and I take this with the grain of salt because it's you know it's implementation. Um, I see also that uh, the GPA for Black students way below the GPA overall for students. I see uh, dismal positives for English learners uh, and for students with IEPs. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm saying this, I'm just, I'm, I'm just reading in the data because um, I know this is, this is, you know, really soon to kind of make uh, any particular conclusion. But my, what comes up for me is, is that there is something deeply rooted in Madison that is beyond uh, beyond a strategy or deeper than a strategy that we, we either we haven't reconciled with or we are afraid to really confront um, that is happening uh, overall in our schools uh, around anti-blackness. And, 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 you know, I think we can, we can continue to have super awesome innovative strategies like pathways, like dual language immersions and whatnot and anti-blackness continues to show up. We're short of justice, you know, we have like PBIS and we have and been really serious about implementing cornerstone strategies uh, along with our uh, other, other peers and having invested significant amount of dollars. Yet our, you know, when we start looking at our data, our data is, is gives us this sort of uneasiness of, of mixed results. Um, the other piece that I really, um, I'm hoping to see more specifically when we present data. And I know we have done that in the past in other areas is to bring like, I really would appreciate a qualitative component to this. I really wanted to hear from, from students in a disaggregated way, uh, how they're experiencing pathways. I think I shared with this board, my daughter experience was, was challenging. Um, and along with also being challenged with dual language immersion program, like. It, you know, La Follette was a really complicated experiment, you know, moving from, you know, different scheduling, you know, at the same time as implementing a new program. So, um, yes, I, I just, I wanted to highlight the, the complication of supporting this really great initiative and at the same time, uh, looking at our, our mixed results for our students. And I want to, I don't know if, I know Dr. Pryor, you, you made some body cues. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that or if I should just keep on and opening the space for more questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, Nikki, I think I saw your hand first and then I see everybody else. Thank you. Nikki, uh, turn your mic on, please. Got it, sorry about that. Um, I've always, I've had mixed feelings on pathways, I'm more of an avid person than a pathways person because of the number of job uh, of job opportunities for students. My hardest part on pathways is one that students are 
can be locked in and can't always get out as easily as need be. And they may not know what they want to do at the age of 14. My other thing is I worry about having to not take certain classes. Um, I know um, sign language classes, I know certain other language classes didn't work with pathways. And I, along with sometimes the earned honors versus the I don't, the entire honors issue. And personally, I don't, I'm not going to comment on that part, but very simply, what it comes down to is this, is it a good program? Yes, but I'm not seeing the results. I wanna see that I, is anti-blackness an issue? I'd be a fool to say that it isn't. At the same point, I wanna see what AVID does and how AVID does it to see if we could improve pathways if that, makes any sense. If some of those strategies that are being used to promote AVID could be used to promote that. And if that could be done in that manner. Because I'm wondering if that data is transferable. Because I want to provide our students with as many job opportunities. And I'm not also seeing a lot of tech opportunities for a ton of our students. I see IT, but I'm not seeing mechanical anything with mechanics. I'm not seeing anything with cooking, with ho with chef, with um, personal training, with fitness. A lot of those are industries that are desperate for people. And I think that that's a disservice. So it's not, I wanna get rid of it. I just would like to amend it. Yep. So I'll chime in real quick and then I'll see if Dr. Jenkins or Lisa wants to add anything. So one, I just want to clarify that a student, if they are currently in a pathway, always has the opportunity to switch pathways and or to uh, currently, right, you could go into the traditional path. So their students is never locked in. The second thing that I want to also add is I want to clarify um, AVID is and always will be um, a program that is targeted for a, a select group of students and isn't going to be a program that is necessarily designed for all, right? So AVID has an elective class. AVID focuses on um, kind of the academic middle and our students of color and first generation, but it is not um, a program designed for all. What we are doing is using our AVID strategies to a school-wide approach, which is one of the things that AVID really uh, uh, um, promotes. And so our Pathways teachers are receiving uh, professional learning around those AVID strategies, but AVID, AVID in itself will always stay as a strand because it is intended to do that for a targeted group of students and not for all. So I just wanted to clarify those few things. And then I'll see if Lisa or Dr. Jenkins wanted to add in. Thank you, Cindy. But I, this time, I would just like to really hear the board members and their feedback, and then I can close it out at the end once everybody finishes. Perfect. Is another can I go? Or? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought somebody else was going to jump in. Um, <laughs> Gloria, please go. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I think you know, we have been struggling um, with this for years and I, I hear, um, you know, you, you know, we've always, so this is where we started, right? We, early on, as far back as I can remember, we had a variety of opportunities for our youth, right? We had different pathways. Um, over the years, that's changed, right? We went from like, a variety of different options to nothing. It's just a four-year college. And um, we along the way, we've lost kids, right? Because a four-year college wasn't for them for a variety of reasons. And I have many family members, my brothers, uh, cousins, um, who uh, didn't, that we lost along the way. Um, and they had to make do with what, uh, a four-year high school degree gave them. That's the reality, right? I mean, that is the, the reality of our black and brown children um, in that it's not necessarily a four-year degree is not um, for them. It's just not what they want to do, 
right? Um, and so uh, that's what Pathways does. I mean, you and you um, and the demand is there, right? I mean, I think if you talk to the chamber, you talk to our business um, uh, leaders, Madison College leaders, um, you know, it is a much needed um, resource uh, for our students. Um, I think the the problem um, of what, what we found along with what Ananda said was, you know, a community, right? The community buy-in is, is our staff buy-in. And that is really what has, um, you know, uh, really stopped us from moving forward is the buy-in within our district and our staff uh, to buy into this and support this. And so I guess I just, I'm wondering how do we move forward from that, right? I mean, I think, that there has to be a, an element of a change in culture to accept um, this, right, fully um, throughout the district. And, um, you know, I think that that is, um, have we fixed those challenges, issues, or are we still gonna continue to see that pushback internally? Because um, that's where I have found was sort of the stopping point and in, in not being able to, to, sh to demonstrate progress. Looks like Mike. We're just taking, oh, Mike, go ahead. Um, I, I'll wait. Can I, can I wait? Um, yeah, why don't we get everybody's comments done? Um, who's, who was that? Okay, uh, Chris uh, Schmidt. Yeah, thanks, Ananda. I guess as I was looking at this, I, I tried to take a step back, um, knowing we were going to talk about pathways and looking at it, how it fits into the larger requirements that we have under PI 26 and the education for employment plans and programs that were required to do by the state. And looking at the report that we recently got surrounding that, um, pathways was one part of it. But it was also a larger um, goal around academic and career planning about around a comprehensive school counseling model, experiential learning for all students, which I know also fits into pathways. AVID was in there, career and tech education was in there, engaging the community was a piece of that. And I guess I'm, I'm just trying to look at it is, are we choosing pathways as the model to get us to this academic and career planning that we're required to do? Or is pathways one of the options? And so this is, you know, like Gloria said, the question has always been, are we going to do the full implementation or is Pathways just a piece of the experiences that students can have in our high schools? And I think there's um, models all over the country that do it in different ways. And so I am actually anxious to hear more or eager to hear more from Dr. Pryor about his experience and what he's seen, you know, in Atlanta and in other parts of the country um, and how places have had success. I know in Long Beach, that was one of the models for us. They don't necessarily have wall-to-wall -wall pathways at every school. They might have different pathways, one or two at different schools. And so it seems like there's a lot of different ways to do this. And so I guess, you know, as we continue this discussion of how we're going to move forward, I think it really is important to continue to involve the community um, in these discussions. And I think the slow and the pause that has come with this implementation for us has really been to learn more about how this is working for students and how we need to adjust and if this is the right choice. And I think I really have appreciated that approach. Um, and one of the focusing on the post-secondary outcomes, that's something we're already required to do and report on. So I guess I would encourage us as we go through, like not to wait for pathways for us to figure out what is happening with our students in the post-secondary, um, you know, their options and what they're experiencing. Um, one of, I have about four or five questions and I'll try to go through these quickly, um, but, you know, the question about what outcomes we're seeing for students and if they are a result of pathways is one of my questions. And I appreciate that matched comparison um, and study to take a look at that. But one of the concerns that I have is that I'm not sure if all of the findings are statistically, statistically significant. And therefore, if the conclusions that we're drawing about whether, you know, those are 
really a difference or not. Um, I'm not sure how to tell that. So like looking at attendance rate, is an attendance rate difference from 90 to 91% really significant? And is that really a difference? I think we need to take a look at that. So I'm hoping we can sort of expand that match study so we know what's really significant or not. And I think that's part of the data that's coming if I'm correct, is that true, Cindy? Yeah, I think Andrew's on also, but I know that for uh, most of the data requests, we'll have that uh, this week. And then some of the other data requests, I think, are going to be uh, coupled into our larger plan of uh, reimagining and uh, reconceptualizing uh, where we want to go. So some will come this week and more later. Andrew, I don't know if you want to chime in at all um, to add any more detail or if that works. Thanks, and then I do have some comments, Chris, for your other things when we get to that point. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, my camera seems to be not working, so hopefully you can hear me just fine. Um, also joining us tonight uh, to help support your understanding and move this work forward is uh, Brianne Monahan and uh, Grady Brown, uh, primary author of the report that the board's received. Um, it's always our job for our PEO to make sure that you as the board uh, have confidence in the decisions and the understanding that you're building. So we take a lot of effort to identify the methodology to make good on that commitment. And, and I think on this one, we may have uh, approached a limit to what's robust and appropriate for this evaluation, which is a long way to say that there may be ways to look further at pathways into the future, but I'm not certain that statistical significance is the, the tool for it. Um, uh, statistical significance will tell you whether or not the, the apparent uh, difference is due to chance or not. Uh, what the board may be interested in is something else along, this, uh, along the lines of maybe effect size. And that gets more to your question, uh, uh, Chris, about whether or not um, what you're seeing you should have faith in. Um, another thing I'll point out is your questions around, is it the result of pathways and this kind of social science that we have, of course, of education, it's difficult to know exact causes because there are so many influencing factors in students' lives. And that complexity um, has caused us to rely a lot more on qualitative evidence. And that is a next step that we identify in our report. Uh, staff and student uh, perceptions and getting a better understanding of their experiences in the program ought to be paired with any future review of uh, this program. Um, and, and really Pathways, I think in particular, will benefit from that additional work because Pathways is really put in place about academic outcomes for sure, but then also really about the values that we have around um, uh, around a sense of belonging, around or along a sense of relevance and those kinds of things. Um, but the kind of rigorous analysis that we put forward, I think given this is a couple of years of data uh, and then a plus a partial given COVID-19, uh, the amount of data that we have, I think the, the propensity score matching that you, you mentioned is a very strong, very robust way of looking at this. In other words, the only real difference between the, the lines that you see those blue versus uh, orange lines, is whether or not a student is participating in pathways. So we take a look, for example, at a student uh, based on their observable characteristics, and the only difference in that match is whether or not one student is in a pathway and one is not. So it takes into account all kinds of extenuating circumstances and contexts. So it is a very robust way of looking at it. And certainly RPEO and I personally have a lot of faith and confidence in the key findings we've provided. Otherwise they wouldn't make them to those uh, you know, ye little yellow boxes at the top of our reports. Um, but certainly uh, interested in, in working with the board and the program to uh, see what sort of future needs we have. And if there are additional statistical analyses to bake them in as part of that scope is definitely the work moving forward. Thank you, Andrew. I guess, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll ask as a follow up, you know, you mentioned qualitative and getting at those staff and student experiences. Do we know when we'll have that piece of this to learn more about it? And yeah, I would have, yeah, I'd have to uh, connect with the team and, and Cindy, um, if, if Cindy or Lisa, you have a feel for it immediately, please share, but um, 
yeah, I think it's it'd be part of a package moving forward. Okay. No other comments on that. I, I have a few more questions and oh, go ahead. I'll try to go quick. Sorry. Um, since the start pathways was intended to be for students from all academic levels with a common interest area as a way to organize learning and connect real world, world experiences. And I think we've run into this perception or implementation or something that pathways is only for some students and not for others. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we um, get away from that or make sure that all levels of students, if they're interested in exploring school through a healthcare lens or a health sciences lens, um, that they're able to do that. And I know that one of the goals initially was to have the pathways match the demographics of the district. And I'm wondering if that's still a goal, I guess. <clears throat> Are you answering that, Cindy? Well, I know we were going to wait for just all of the board to kind of state yeah. their questions. I'm, and so, yeah, yeah so I'm I just wanted that, to reiterate that. Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering if that's maybe. Sure. Go ahead, Chris. You just want me to throw them all out there? It's, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, and then I guess um, there's references in the report about um, access to earning advanced coursework credit. And I know that when we have um, pathways sort of added the element to our district of earned honors, and I know that you, you spoke to a number of different things that are included in advanced coursework. And I guess I'd like to see a breakdown of how those fall out for pathways and non-pathway students and the access that students are getting to those opportunities. Um, to earn the different types of advanced coursework credit. And then my last question is around the resources for Pathways. You mentioned that um, we've received $750,000 um, to sort of start our efforts. And I'm, I know it started as a grant. Um, maybe you could explain a little bit more about that and where we are in the grant process and then how this um, we're looking to fund this going forward, knowing that it is resource intensive. Thank you, Chris. Um, Karuzi, you had a question too, right? Thanks, Ananda. I have several questions actually, which I'll throw out there. Some of them, um, some of the questions I had others have asked, so that helps. Um, so um, I wanna um, dig into the data a little bit more. Um, Chris asked some of the questions that I had and Andrew, I appreciate your answers. Um, I, I really though want to get a direct answer to the question. Um, first of all, can we say with certainty that we are actually seeing effects here in the data that we were presented and that those effects are the result of pathways and specifically the pathways instructional model? Um, Andrew, you did mention that um, with the propensity matching, um, the only difference is whether or not a student is participating in pathways. I want to push back against that a little bit. I think another very important difference that you actually did mention in the report is whether or not a student applied for pathways. We don't have a big enough applicant pool to do propensity matching with students who applied and got in and students who applied and didn't get in. And the fact that a student applied for pathways is matched to a student who didn't apply with path for pathways, that's a difference and that's a real difference. And I think we can't ignore that difference when we're looking at this data. Um, I'm hopeful that we will get the data on enrollment and demographics this year. And I would really like to see a gender breakdown between the two pathways we have, ITC and health sciences. I'm hearing anecdotally that there are gender differences, that more um, students who identify as male are leaning towards ITC and more students who identify as female are leaning towards health sciences. Um, it's anecdotal. I'd like to know if that is real because um, if we are seeing gender differences, that is um, something to think about, particularly since it sort of reflects the stereotypes of those two um, career paths. And there are income potential differences between those two career paths. Um, so, you know, my first question is, I really want to know if we can say with certainty that we are seeing effects and that those effects are the result of the Pathways Instructional Model. Mm -hmm. um, the second questions I have are about budget. Um, People have talked about it. Um, 
we've, you know, a couple of people have mentioned that Pathways is very expensive. And um, even though we've been working on this for seven or eight years, we've never actually seen a complete budget for Pathways that not only includes just um, some of the costs of curriculum and administrators, but also includes the costs of repurposing. Um, we've been told that like, well, we can cover the cost of Pathways by repurposing staff into Pathways, but there's a cost to doing that. Um, again, we haven't received this data, but I've reached out to staff at every high school that's doing Pathways, so um, Memorial and Easton La Follette. And I heard at at least one school that they've had to drop AP course offerings to make sure that they have the allocations for Pathways. That's a cost. Um, either, you know, to maintain those AP offerings, we have to add staff or there is a cost to losing other course offerings to students. So I think we need a complete budget that shows all the costs of Pathways, including repurposed staff, and we need a cost benefit analysis. We really need to think hard about like the way we're doing pathways now are the costs um, and the benefits like, you know, consider them side by side. And if we don't think the benefits weren't the cost, what changes do we need to make so that the benefits increase? Um, I think we also need to know what the community is contributing. I think um, our community partners deserve the acknowledgement that they are investing in this program and that should be part of the budget. Um, so budget is my second question. Um, my third question, um, I would like to get more detail um, about the qualitative data collection that people have mentioned. I agree, it's really, really important. We need to do it. Um, and I would like to know more about, you know, specifically about the plans for interviewing parents, students, and staff, both um, in Pathways. And I really think we need to talk to students and families that opted not to go into Pathways. Um, and that the board needs to get an in-depth and complete summary of that qualitative research before we can really think about making decisions about moving or scaling this up. Um, in talking to staff at the schools that are doing pathways in a significant way, um, I've heard concerns in a number of areas. One is just that there's a lot of unintended consequences of the pathways model. Um, one being concerns that there could be future segregation, um, a concern that we are currently and in the future could be clustering special education students to the detriment of inclusion, um, concerns that about you know, very significant scheduling issues that reduce students' ability to access fine arts and other electives, um, loss of AP courses due to pathway staffing needs, um, and that the pathways aren't actually personalized. Like when this is fully implemented, students will have a choice of four or five career pathways, and we may have students who just aren't excited about any of them. Um, the costs are something that have come up in conversations I've had with staff. Um, the, um, the staff are concerned that the instructional model feels forced and inauthentic um, and is at the, you know, the having to like try to figure out how to weave, say, ITC into a history class distracts from the extremely important and time consuming work of trying to do culturally relevant, relevant, culturally responsive teaching and anti-racist teaching and make sure that actually the curriculum reflects the identities and the history and the real lived experiences of the students in the classroom. Trying to figure out how to like put computer science into the curriculum on top of that is, is has been hard on our staff. Um, and finally, um, you know, just the high volume of meetings and time that Pathways takes needs to be acknowledged because it's, you know, it's time that's not necessarily being used to support students um, in other ways and make sure that they don't slip through the cracks. Um, and finally, I really would like to know the plan moving forward for the board and administration to work together as a team to make well-informed decisions about um, where we go with Pathways. Um, Cindy, I, I appreciate that you talked about reimagining and reconceptualizing where we want to go. And um, I also really appreciated the comments about what will life look like in the future and how does Pathways reflect that. I think those questions are a really great starting point for um, deciding how we all work together as a team to move forward on Pathways and move forward on making sure that all the good things in Pathways, um, focusing on relationships, focusing on authentic hands-on learning experiences and making sure that we're like making sure our high schools truly engage kids so they want to like stay in school and move on to be college career and community ready happen. I, I think we can't do that unless we're all working together. And I think that means that decisions about Pathways expansion need to be made as a team and the board needs to have a voice in those decisions about expansion. So I would like to know what the plans are for um, board votes and board voice as we move forward. Thank That's you so much. So I'm going to go to Savian and then Ali. 
Yeah, thank you so, so much for the presentation and research going into this. Um, having said that, I do want to echo some of Chris's concerns, particularly around uh, the Pathways curriculum, not, you know, explicitly being anti-racist, let alone you know, the lack of a curriculum and it being up to staff uh, to, to implement it into their own lesson plans on their own, uh, taking up more staff time. Um, you know, I, I would like to see more options available for students. Um, while, you know, the concerns about tracking and, and gender roles currently, but also, you know, the current, uh, you know, lack of inclusion of the arts and humanities um, in our pathways programs too. And then, um, you know, particularly at La Follette, have heard a lot of concerns about implementation versus schedule. Um, and it, um, you know, students having to make tough decisions because, um, you know, it's between pathways and another class they want to take. Um, and what that means for the total schedule offerings that will follow it too. Um, so those are my primary three uh, concerns. Thank you so much, Savian. Ali? Thank you so much for the presentation, y'all. I want to give a little shout out to the young people who are the first cohort to go for four years and graduate from Pathways. Um, you know, it's a big thing to, to be those first kiddos and it isn't always like easy, right? And so thanks y'all for, for trying it out and sticking with it and following things you're passionate about. Um, I also want to thank the team because to be doing this in its infancy and have COVID happen, um, it can be really crushing to this kind of work, right? Especially work that's co coordinated at this level with our community. Um, and so I think your continued commitment to these students and to this work and to this support um, is, is something I have nothing but admiration for. I want to thank you, Sydney, Cindy, in, in, in highlight, you know, your long term work with with our students and pathways. Um, I, I, I want to point out that I think particularly when we are, are speaking to the achievement gap, when we're speaking to dynamics of race, that we have to talk about behavior data. We have to talk about if our pathway students are more or less likely to, to be suspended, to you know, be sent out of class, to, to be removed. I want to echo what Savian and Chris said about the arts. Um, and shout out to, I, I will say, when we talk about career college ready, um, I think of the class that most prepared me for college. And and that was Arts and Ideas with Jessica Hotz my senior year. It was the first philosophy class I ever took. And I wonder if a course like that fits into personalized pathways. Um, so that concern about our kids getting to take the electives they want, are they getting to participate in chorus and band and orchestra? Um, are they continuing to have robust opportunities in a variety of areas while participating in pathways? I think is a really important question. I thank Savian and Chris for bringing it up. The other thing I want to speak to is the slide in which you showed uh, certifications. I, I think that's a really exciting slide. I think it's really, really important to say, hey, these young people are gaining things that they can take out into the community, out into the world, um, that help them get into college, that allow for them to achieve dual credit for college and high school. I think that is incredible. And what I would like to see added to that slide is how many of our students, and I know we're at our first year of kids graduating, so I, I understand that this could take a little, uh, a little bit of time in terms of kind of accumulative um, data around, you know, the long-term results of participating in, in personalized pathways. But how many of our kids who have spent four years in personalized pathways or how many of our kids in general graduate, register to vote with a driver's license or a passport or a state ID? These kind of staple things that allow for, for all kids to participate in our community. Um, if we're talking about career, community, college ready, uh, I think that there are things that we can uh, encourage our students to participate, support our students to participate in broadly. Uh, the number one thing on a job application that you're asked for is whether or not you have a high school diploma. The number two thing is whether or not you have a driver's license. Okay. So, you know, when we're talking about career opportunities and job opportunities, um, making sure that our kids are enfranchised, making sure that our kids have the, the ability uh, to drive or navigate public transportation. I think all of these things are, are relevant to this work. Thank you all so much for your presentation and cheers to the kiddos who made it through this first four years of Pathways. We're proud of you. Thank you so much, Ali, for humanizing this experience of 2021 20, um, seniors 
um, that have endured so much. Uh, Nikki? Just wanted to um, amplify Ali's comments as a non-driver, because I do not drive due to the CP. The number of jobs I've had to turn down because of lack of a driver's license is huge. If people could find who, we don't even cover driver's ed in MMSD. We don't even offer it. It's done privately. And the number of students who are losing out on job opportunities because it's something we don't provide. Mine's medical. There's nothing I can do about it. But if it's a financial barrier, I think the school should teach it. And we should provide it. And I think money needs to go there because we are putting our kids at a disadvantage. Thank you, Nikki, you know, for highlighting this really important. Oh, Savian, go ahead. Never mind, it's not important. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to give an opportunity. This is a, this is a lot. I think that uh, it speaks to the energy of this board to really, um, you know, give, yeah, to really promote and inspire change in our district. I think I really appreciate all my colleagues, like, the passion was definitely obvious, the concern around uh, a real implementation of, of any program, it's, it's there. So I wanna give administration a chance to, to respond to, uh, uh, I know we're not gonna be able to hit in all the questions, but uh, what, what you all would like to speak to and then what we can expect to see uh, shared with us in the future. Okay, I, I think I'll go ahead and speak to it right now. I know that there were some direct names called out from Andrew to Cindy or whatever, uh, Dr. Pryor, but I want to just go ahead and lead in and lean into it this particular way. First of all, thank you to the team, your presentation both tonight. You know, you did a really outstanding job and what talent we have here in our district. And thank you. I'll go back to uh, Mike in terms of the way you lift it up. You know, some of the challenges we're having, but also some of the positive things you and Dr. Pryor both. Uh, thank you for that and Cindy as well. Uh, the point of why I wanted to hear from the board coming in new as I'm still in the observation stage and as we're getting ready to go through the budgetary stage, um, as we went out on the referendum, heard a lot of things. And we we're talking about early literacy now um, and beyond, uh, which plays into ultimately what happens at the middle and the high schools as well. And there was a great discussion several years prior to me getting here in terms of things we needed to do. And we landed on pathways as one of the strategies. Cindy said it was a regional strategy, actually state and national. These are discussions that were happening and have been happening across our country as we've been trying to figure out what is this thing with high school dropout rate? Why aren't we uh, giving more kids uh, opportunities to remain engaged, not because they weren't smart enough. A lot of it, uh, children, as uh, Gloria said, they no longer had interest in going to a four-year university. And some had interest in going to four-year university, but they were being forced to do, um, do it the way we wanted them, them to do it right now. As you heard me on the referendum trail, I talked about not only being our own uh, goal here, being uh, ready for, you know, graduated from high school, ready for college, careers, and community, but also talked about articulated skilled trades, which broadens, and we heard that on the referendum trail too, the pathways, and I think, uh, Gloria, you mentioned that they narrow now from what we started out doing to where we are. We talked about how things are a little bit expensive. All those things are true, and let me acknowledge the questions that uh, board members raise. Um when the presentation was done to me, I had some questions too, and I think the team did a fine job of trying to respond to them. Across the country, this thing started out and there was support from the community. What I'm saying is reciprocal accountability. We need to have not only the local community, but also our states pouring into what they're saying in terms of this whole forecast of what it's gonna look like in the job market. But we have to, we have to think about the job market what students we also have now and how they've been accelerating their learning. COVID-19 impacted a lot of us, period. Uh, I think the questions being raised tonight, we won't be able to give you all the responses tonight, I think, but it brings to the point that we probably should just pause on this 
as we're going through our budgetary discussions now, we need to become very intentional of responding to the things that we've said we were going to do. I didn't say stop uh, this discussion or moving forward with pathways. Coming in as a new superintendent, I've had some discussions with some of our community members, some of our business community members, and I need to continue that. And so we need to come back answering these questions. I agree with Chris that we need to work collaboratively to get this done, but we have to engage the community, engage the students, get their voices. We have to get the parents' voices. We have to go back. And I think even in its infancy, we have to spell it out. What are the real advantages of this unintended? I think sometimes we can get some negative um, residuals, but in the emphasis of planning, we have to talk about purpose and how we're going to go about doing things so we do not limit. Dr. Pryor said it. I was in Atlanta as well. It's not yes or, it's and, yes and. We could do these things, but we have to be very intentional with our dollars. The question of concerns in terms of you may get from parents, you may get it from teachers, you may get it from students. We need to hear those things and build them into our planning. But for right now, in terms of talking about next steps, we need to have more conversations. This has been one of the most robust conversations we've had about academics, right, at the secondary level since I've been here. And I think we need to just for a minute, just put a slight pause, have more conversation. And as we're building this up through, how do we make it happen? The grant always comes to an end, not sometimes. And then what? How do we make this where we can sustain it? Our students are used to starting and stopping. We don't need to make an investment like this that we're going to start, stop, start, stop. Kudos to the children who made it through the four years and graduated. Wow, they're graduating 2021 and they've gone through this pathway programs. But if we're going to move forward, which I do believe we should because it's so many students and this has been shown in so many places to increase the graduation rate, increase the level of engagement of all students. And it's not just for the most marginalized groups of students. We need to cut that narrative right now. This is for all students and a student can go today and wanna to be a welder and choose tomorrow they wanna be an engineer. This program allows that to happen. But hey, what's wrong with being a welder? You can go and become an offshore welder and at age 19 be making $136,000 a year. But it's not about money, it's about passion. Allow me to do what I want to do. Our job should be to make sure that every child come through our system, that they are skill ready. When we say graduate ready, we need to mean that. Right now, our proficiency levels do not reflect what I am hearing from people we believe. So that's a real conversation we have to have, too. If we want to get bold, let's talk about that. And then students can have the choice, no matter which program we decide. If we get them all reading, handle our business early on, then they have a choice whether they want to become a neurophysicist, if they want to become a lawyer, if they want to become a welder. And that's what we have to talk about, our program in totality. There are some problems, and Ananda started to go into it. Are we an anti-racist district or not? Period. Let's stop playing with that. If we are an anti-racist district, let's talk about those barriers that we have, regardless of the program, where some children seem to still succeed and others don't. That's a problem. So if we're going to have a robust discussion, let's have it. We're going to be collaborative. Let's be collaborative. But let's not take off those real things that we know historically. Said it during the referendum. Historically, our black and brown children, our poor children, our special ed children, our ELL children have not received the same level of education. I am not looking forward and will not be a part of leading back to what we were because prior to COVID, we had a number of children not doing well. Our goal should be saying, let's explore all those things that we can lift to ensure the greatest amount of success for all children. The questions that you asked tonight, they're real questions, we'll come back. But I do think we need to also look at how we measure what we're doing. And no disrespect to anyone, we need to involve other people. We have this university here. Bring them in. Let's talk about the questions, we, how we go about even asking questions. Let's ask the right questions so we can get the right results so it informs our planning as we go along. So right now, in terms of next steps, I'm looking forward to getting with the board, talking with our staff, engaging students, engaging parents, and engage in our business community 
and working with the university to assist us in becoming this robust district that we all are hoping that we can become and that we will become. And we'll get back to you with the answers to your questions. I wanna go back and have further conversations with our staff because I don't think we're in a place right now to move what I know, not just pathways, but the whole articulated skill trades piece and getting our students to the next level. Um, it feels like I've been here five years, but after I think about it, I think I may have only been here about what, four months, five months, something like that. I don't know who's counting, but nevertheless, but I do think we're at the right place to look at disrupting our system in a very mm -hmm. positive way. But we should not be cutting out arts. Uh, we should not be cutting out other classes. We can do both, but we just have to figure out how we do it together. And there is a cost associated with it. I'll stop right there. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, there's something that you mentioned, uh, this call to really center on anti-racist and what is what is it really like to go beyond just saying that we're anti-racist and actualizing being an anti-racist district. Uh, I noticed that we used the student profile in the beginning of this, this presentation that Stu say that we are valuing cultural competency, which is this uh, philosophical aspiration that we're understanding other people's uh, culture as a means to uh, to be inclusive and you know the the evolution of that work is is uh, the anti-racist. So how do we incorporate that into our student profile? But I really appreciate um, all your comments and your sharpness on on um, leading our district uh, to you know, to change, um, to be what it can be. So I really appreciate that. Uh, no, I'm looking- Anana, maybe, can I just go ahead and say, I'm sorry. I appreciate the questions from the board though. A great board raises great questions. And then we work together, as Chris said, to do it, to put the plan together. The board shouldn't move without the staff and staff should move without the board. And we should not move without our community. We have to get the voices of our community. They are important. And I'm not just talking about the adults. Our children are experiencing this virtual learning like we never experienced it before. And I think their voices are gonna be critical in this work that we do. Thank you. So I'm looking at the team to see anybody else wants to say, but I did take a note that, you know, we tended to wait a long time to talk about secondary plan. And we had a pretty robust conversation about early literacy and we haven't tackled or talked about middle school, which is a which is a really complicated and complex time for our young uh, our young children. So before I turn to the team, Savian, you have um, something else to add? Yeah, thank you, Ananda. Um, and yeah, I just want to uh, just so much appreciation for Dr. Jenkins for constantly asking that question. Are we an anti-racist school district or not? And if we are, well, then we have to honestly assess our practices and uh, the results we're getting. Um, something I also just wanted to highlight, especially with the trades um, and the different experiences that our students go through is the, the relevance of PI-25 um, and that the Wisconsin State Constitution guarantees our students 20 years of a free public education and you know how this fits into meeting the needs of students, you know, given where they are at their point in life. If, um, you know, some feel like um, it, they, they'd be better off serving their family working for a year, uh, that they can come back to MMSD and still earn their education as well. Um, and how that ties then to linking them up with internships um, uh, uh, and helping them get a s s certification, especially in the trades and elsewhere. Thank you, Savian. Um, Cindy, Lisa, Dr. Pryor, or Mike, any final words for us to wrap up our day or our night? I, I would just echo what Dr. Jenkins said. Thank you for the questions. Thanks for the conversation. Um, we are going to continue to uh, uh, hear from our community, continue to reflect and adjust, and uh, be back in conversation with everyone here. So I just uh, would echo thank you for the time for both presentations tonight. I wanna say thank you to everybody. And I wanna point out, Dr. Pryor has made me step up my game. He, he wore a tie, so I had to wear a jacket. 
Put that on record. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I did tell her what the team has said so far. It's been a wonderful night, and uh, we definitely thank you guys for allowing us to come forth and just share um, information in regards to the secondary side of the house. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. I would like to entertain a, a motion to adjourn. Thank you so much, the team, for this great presentation and all the information that you all provided tonight. Um, uh, anyone motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Uh, motion carried by Nikki, second by Ali. All those in favor say aye. Uh, oppose, motion carry, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Have a great night, guys. Bye. Thank you, Barb. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. <laughs>